crazy awesome show for you guys today. Like if you, I have a baby dinosaur behind me and that's just kind of a hint as to what we'll be talking about a little bit later because we have William Stout in the house. It's amazing. We'll be talking about his book and we will be featuring a Q&A with him. So ask so many questions about him. He has had such an amazing life and career and ask him about dinosaurs. He knows so much about them. We were just talking about them before the show starts. It was rad. Um, we also have the Grace premium format figure from Aspen Comics, the Soulfire series that is amazing and beautiful and here in the studio. So we'll be talking about her a little bit with Breeze coming back to do a segment with me about Grace. And then we have the Aquaman premium format figure because, well, well because Jason Momoa, right, right, Right. And because, and um, Jason and Jason Momoa. And then I feel like there's a movie coming out that has Jason Momoa in it. So <laughs> also Chicky's in the house today. So, you know, things are going to get like a little bit crazy. We also have the whole crew. We have Brie, we have Sam, Brett, Brendan, Challenger, and Jeff. Jeff's here. We didn't forget about you. So, um, First up, let's just get started. We have our featured collector of the week. His name is Roddy Gut. He's from Sweden. He's from somewhere in like, yeah, Sweden Challenger or Switzerland? I think it was Switzerland. Switzerland, yes. okay. Yeah, he has a, look at these cases that he has his Court of the Dead figures in. They're just stunning. All these, I love watching how people display their collections. They're so cool. So thank you so much, Roddy, for sharing your collection with us. If you would like to be the next featured collector, please go to our blog at side.show slash blog and click the apply now button. We love seeing your collections. It's so cool. You'll be featured on the show and in our blog. So yeah, don't be afraid. We don't bite. We just want to see what you got. So thank you. Um, normally I just push to our Alexa skill for the news because that is where you get all of the most up-to-date news nowadays is through the Alexa skill or through like iTunes, wherever you can download podcasts. We have your the Let Your Geek Side Show daily geek update. But oh my God, the Captain Marvel trailer. We cannot go another second without talking about it. Please tell me everyone in this room has seen it. Yes. Yes. Guys, she like that, that scene where she's flying and she's spinning and she's like using her full power, that helmet, that hair. Come on. It's like, the scene where she punches the old woman. Oh, of course. Chicky <laughs> likes her punching the old woman. I'm all about her using her powers in space, but you know, and I'm also way about the cat. Can we talk about Goose and how I really hope they elaborate on what that cat actually is in the comics? So, um, yeah. There's fan theories online already about how maybe the cat is how Nick Fury loses his eye. <laughs> But um, so you you enjoyed the punching of the old woman. Let's I talk did. about that. I did. Well, the, in the beginning, the, the shorter trailer, they just had that really quick shot. Right. But then they show the the, the woman older fighting actress and the and the stunt move mm -hmm. that they did, which mm -hmm. I thought was awesome. Mm -hmm. but it's just so <laughs> shocking. I mean, yeah, was it was pretty movie. awesome. Yeah. Yes, but then showing the full range of her power, and I just cannot wait for that movie. Yeah. I like the. The trick that they did with the the hair, the, with yeah, it's the disappearing headpiece, and then her hair just flies out. Mm -hmm. That's just cool. <sighs> We're all excited about this movie in here, right? Right? Yeah. 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 Jeff's if trying space, to be quiet. I love it. What? I said, if it's space, I love it. If it's space, you love it. So that's really your only bar, Sam. You're it's just like yeah. you're just like space. I'm there. Cool. Right. I yeah, he's just I doing this to me. <laughs> yeah. Things blowing up in space. In space, no one can hear you scream. But the explosions look great. But the explosions look great, even though they wouldn't actually happen because there's no oxygen. Well, you can hear the explosions too. Yeah, you so can. Okay, don't be a downer. <laughs> <laughs> don't be a downer. Okay, okay, okay. Cool. Well, Oh my gosh, Captain Marvel trailer. If you guys haven't, it's seriously, I don't know how you haven't. If you're watching our show and haven't seen the Captain Marvel trailer. What you doing? Yeah, but like still watch the show. Just watch the Captain Marvel okay. trailer after. Uh, where can they see? They can see it on our Facebook page, on our, we definitely shared it on Instagram. We definitely retweeted it. Um, but Marvel Studios is where <clears throat> it's also there as well. But we put it everywhere. It's in our blog. 
We just can't stop talking about it here. It's so amazing. Speaking of amazing, we have a short video break for you. And when we come back, I have Brie. So that's awesome. But also the Grace Premium Format figure. You guys are watching Sideshow Live. We'll be right back. Hi, Brie. Hi, Susan. How's it going? It's going good. Awesome. You guys are watching Sideshow Live. We are back here with my amazing co-host, Brie. She decided to come back and talk about Grace because I yes. heard you wanted to learn a little bit more about the Soulfire series. Yes. I would love to know more about the Soulfire series, especially Grace, because look how gorgeous she is. I know. This piece made its debut in New York this year and just everything just took off from there because <laughs> yeah, she has bet. wings get it <laughs> yeah i'm funny funny <laughs> i'm funny i'm funny um so this is grace from soulfire she is a great pairing for our aspen oh yeah premium format yeah. figure who is from the same comic book line though they're from different worlds because the soulfire world is a little bit different it's a world where kind of tech has taken over and she's the last of her species known as the rahumi and they um, are trying to introduce magic back into the world. Oh. So it's kind of amazing. No wonder she's so magical. So a lot of the things that you see in her comic books are like, she pops with all this color that you see right here because everything's like a tech world and it's like mechanical and oh. computerized. So she's like the light. She's bringing the soul fire back in and that's her exclusive is actually like a swap out with the soul fire itself. Oh, that's on her awesome. Arm. So one of the um, main things about her species is they all have different types of insect wings. And um, it's indicated by these tattoos that are on their backs and on their faces. So obviously she has dragonfly wings and you can see the dragonfly. There's are these on her, mm -hmm. her that, eye too? Yeah, the dragonfly wings on her yeah. eyes. So pretty. Yeah, so Bree, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about what the figure, the figure? I would love to. Grace stands at 28 inches tall. That's over two feet tall, guys. She's quite mighty looking. She's got a 22 inch wingspan. And <laughs> <laughs> such a cute stat. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this so cool? Oh my I'm God. kind of obsessed with it. Um, again, just, she's got, sorry? No, I just, the wings. I'm just emphasizing, like, yeah. Yeah, they're really oh. pretty. Um, this is like goals for a Halloween costume. <laughs> right? How do we even do this? Yeah, right? Oh my god. Okay, so she's, like we already mentioned, she's got these tattoos that indicate her heritage. And she's got a fully sculpted costume, and it's really pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, and an exclusive swap out, her hand comes with this surge of magic, which is the soul fire, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Pre-orders for Grace start tomorrow, December 6th, uh, between noon and 3 p.m. So right now you can go RSVP for Grace at side.show slash Grace PF. Side.show slash Grace PF. Oh my gosh. Just And those order times are between Pacific. Pacific time, yes. Pacific time. Between noon and 3 p.m. Pacific time. Also something amazing about just look at the paint on yeah. her. Can, Besides the translucent resin, that is clearly her wings are at least impartially done in that. But the iridescence of her hair and the way it changes color. Yeah, her hair is so nicely sculpted, too. Oh it's God. got so much detail. Yeah. It's, She's gorgeous. It's so amazing. I'm kind of obsessed with her. I am, too. <laughs> we can be obsessed with her together. Okay. Yeah, sounds awesome. <laughs> so um, we have a short video break, and when we come back, we have Aquaman. We'll actually call him Aquaman during this segment, we promise. He's not just 
for Momoa. He's also Aquaman as well. So Arthur Curry will be here when we're back. Thank you so much for coming and talking about so Grace with me. So happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Um, you're watching Sideshow Live. We'll be right back. I think he's gorgeous. He looks so good. Um, this is the <laughs> Aquaman premium format figure, you guys. How pretty is this, by the way? So pretty. It's, it's oh, handsome. Sorry, he is handsome. My bad. He can be pretty. He has flowing locks. Those are pretty. Um, <laughs> this is the um, Aquaman premium format figure. He made quite a splash in New York. Uh, <laughs> I can be funny. Right? Um, uh, when. Let us know when you start. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> See what I mean? This is what happens when Chicky's here. I'm getting roasted. Um, but everyone's been talking about this figure ever since, wanting him to go available for pre order. Even Jason Momoa got a chance to take a look at him. Jeff was there. How'd, how'd that go? Uh, that, was, uh, that was amazing, actually. Yeah. He yeah. was really, really excited about it. It's really nice when you can actually see someone's face light up. Oh, I it's, love that. The coverage is on Jason's Instagram. Oh, the coverage for it is on Jason's Instagram. That's amazing. So that's at Pride of Gypsies. I may or may not have that memorized. Anyway, <laughs> um, so this is based on, the, on Jason Momoa's appearance in the upcoming Aquaman film by James Wan. Um, you can see so many details on it, including there's Atlantean script on his trident. I don't know if we can get close enough in there. I swear it's there. I can see it. But um, it is there. He has a sculpted golden scaled cost. Oh, there you go. Ooh, see, it's up there. And then it's in the center as well. If you move down, there we go. See all the Atlantean script on the trident right there. There we go. Ooh, pretty. Um, he has a sculpted um, golden scales on his chest, but his pants are actually fabric. And they have, they were made to replicate in, like in reference to as, um, like this is the quarter scale version of the pants that they actually had on him because our team was actually able to go and see the pants and feel them in order to do a replica of the actual pants that he wears in his costume. So he has an Atlantis theme base, as you can see, with a Kraken kind of wrapping itself around these steps. Um, I do want to say it's authentic seaweed, but it's not. It's sculpted seaweed. Um, but he does have his Aquaman um, symbol that you do see um, on everything that Arthur Curry kind of touches. It's from DC Comics. It is in the movie. And we're just really excited for this movie to come out on December 21st. You can see that uh, this figure also has the golden eyes of Aquaman from this costume and of course Jason Momoa's luscious locks. I did write that in the script by the way so <laughs> I just he has such good hair I'm just saying. Um, the exclusive is a swap out left hand holding the Ocean Master's mask and he is available um, for pre-order tomorrow, December 6th, between noon and 3 p.m. Pacific time. But his RSVP page is live, so if you head on over to side.show slash king of Atlantis, 
That's side.show slash king of Atlantis. You can RSVP, RSVP to be first to be notified for when this amazing figure is available for pre-order. I just noticed, I, I've seen this figure so many times. I was at New York Comic Con. I just noticed there's a tattoo coming out of the top. I, that's so cool. Like down to the last detail, it's, it's amazing. Wow, that's actually a really good shot that you're looking at right now of the piece. Um, so yeah, the RSVP list lets you choose how you want to be notified. So with Grace and with Aquaman, um, you can head on over to their RSVP pages and you can either be notified via email or via text when the figure that you want goes live on our website for pre-order. So you guys, that's amazing. We have another short break for you. And when we come back, we will be talking to William Stout. You're watching Sideshow Live and we'll be right back. to Sideshow Live. We have such a special guest here today coming off his latest book release from our friends over at Inside Editions. We have in the studio, Mr. William Stout. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. 
so much for joining us today. It is so awesome to have you here. How well, are you? Thanks for having me, yeah. Susan. I'm great. I'm so excited to be out promoting this book because it covers my whole career, 50 it's, years. Of I have had a chance to flip through it. It's beautiful. Oh, I'm so excited that this is coming out. It's it's just stunning. Inside did an amazing job. It's got big fold outs and, and I've never seen my work reproduced so faithfully. The color is just spot on. It's oh, just incredible. Wow. Oh, I love that. So um, just a little bit about William. Um, you are a very talented artist and you have you've done work that ranges from storyboards to production design and you've done exhibitions and album covers and you've even had work in the smithsonian and the british museum yes wow so even with all of that on your resume your specialty is paleontological art that's one of them what yeah. just one of them how another, many others <laughs> well the way the book is arranged is 12 chapters and mm -hmm. each chapter is on a different aspect of my career. So there's a chapter on comics, chapter on my film design, chapter on theme park design, chapter on Antarctica where I've spent a lot of time. I read about that. Chapter on dinosaurs and and album covers because you did yeah, for the whole Rolling music, Stones. Whole music chapter. Yeah, <laughs> it's Rolling crazy. Stones and the Ramones and the Who and just those little bands that, you know, no big deal. <laughs> That's so amazing. I was looking at them and I was like I have that Rolling Stones album. Mm. So I just went. And I was still doing it. I got a call from Dubai the other day. It was Cat Stevens. <gasps> he said, you probably don't realize this. My son gave me a copy of your blues book. I did a book called Legends of the Blues. Mm -hmm. He said, that's how I learned how to play, listening to Big Bill Brunzi and Lead Belly and all those guys. He said, would you consider doing my next album cover? It's got a lot of blues on it. <laughs> and I said, Heck yeah. So that album cover is in the book too. Oh my God. I'm like not going to cry. I swear. Cat Stevens is my all time favorite artist. He's so incredible. All time favorite artist. He was so okay. sweet and down to earth. I'm not going to cry. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, first up, how we're going to start a little bit with the paleontological art. So sure. how did you get yeah. into that? Okay, well, when I, <laughs> when I was three years old, my parents took me to see my very first movie. We didn't even have a TV back then. This mm -hmm. was 1952. And they took me to the Reseda Drive-In to see the re-release of the original 1933 King Kong. And I think it did damage at a genetic level. Because <laughs> I've been nuts about dinosaurs ever since and crazy about that movie ever since. It's still my favorite movie of all time. It's a brilliant film. And I've been drawing dinosaurs ever since then. That's, wow. So in the mid Mid 1970s, my friend Don Glut, he had a book called The Dinosaur Dictionary, mm -hmm. and he thought it's time to revise that book. There have been so many new dinosaurs found. Mm -hmm. So his goal was to have at least one image per listing. And I agreed to do four, which turned into 44. And that started to launch my dinosaur man career. Uh -huh. I joined the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. I attend their meetings every year to stay updated on all my dinosaur info. And That's amazing. my regular publisher, Byron Price, was visiting me and he said, if you could do your own book on anything, what would you do? And I thought he was just being conversational. I, I really didn't have an answer. And he saw all these dinosaur dictionary pictures around my studio. He said, well, would you like to do one on dinosaurs? I said, sure, that'd be fun. Forgot about it. Two months later, I got a phone call from Byron. He says, Bill, we got our book deal. But Bantam Books wants to do your big dinosaur book. And suddenly I had this gigantic project dropped in my lap. Oh my God. And I got real serious about it. I started contacting the living paleontologists who had discovered a lot of the creatures that were in the book. And this was before email. So I would do pencil drawings and then Xerox them and then mail them to the paleontologists <sighs> to get their feedback. And it would go back and forth until we were both happy with what was done. Oh my gosh. So the book became a bestseller. It was featured in Life magazine and uh, really, that launched my career as a paleo artist. Wow. Oh my gosh. I, that's so amazing. So is some of the art that you brought from that book? No. No, the this art is from a different I brought book. is from a brand new book <gasps> that I thought I wasn't supposed to tell anybody about, but I just got the, the okay, okay from Sideshow that I can discuss it. As you know, Sideshow has done a whole series of magnificent dinosaur sculptures. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely incredible. They're decorating the set yeah. right now. So Sideshow called me up and they said, look, we've got a book coming out. It's going to be photographs of all our beautiful sculptures of dinosaurs. Uh, would you mind doing your own interpretation of one of our dinosaurs? And I said, well, how many did you guys do? And they said, 18. I said, let me do all 18. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so the first one I tackle, it's actually not a dinosaur, it's a mosasaurus, which is a seagoing lizard. Mm -hmm. They're the ancestors of the monitor lizards. Mm -hmm. And I did this one first, but I, I didn't think it was dynamic enough, so I did a new version. So you, you can see what this looks like. Are you getting glare on that? Nope. Oh my gosh. So this is a little more dynamic. Oh my and that's gosh. what they ate. They ate those big ammonites, which are sort of like nautilus. I've I have like because you can go to you know museums of national natural history and you always have those guys in in the rocks. Right, and sometimes well at the San Diego Natural History Museum, I've got twelve murals there, and one of them is of just a, twelve of a Cretaceous <laughs> sea scene. And next to it, they've got a cabinet with the ammonites, with the bite marks of the mosasaurs in the shell. Holy moly! Uh, super cool. Oh my gosh! I'm next time I'm in San Diego. Guess where I'm going? Wow, that's. So this this is one of my favorites that I've done for the new dinosauria <gasps> book. Oh. This is Dilophosaurus, a Triassic dinosaur. Oh. And. That's so cool. Yeah, the strange double crest on his head. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's amazing. So, Love doing this stuff. Now, one of the things I had fun with was there were four Jurassic dinosaurs mm -hmm. that are in the series. And so I did four pictures, but I made it so that if you put them all together, it makes one big, long panorama. Oh, wow. So they all go end to end to end. And then I did the same thing with the Cretaceous, but that's with eight pictures. So eight pictures, if you put them all together, they make one big, gigantic picture. That's so cool. Oh, my gosh. I love this. I love this so much. So be on the lookout, everyone, for the Dinosauria book uh, that has the art of William Stout in it. Yeah. That's amazing. So dinosaurs are pretty amazing, but so is working on movies. So yeah. how did you evolve your career into film? Well, it's funny. I was doing movie posters, mm -hmm. and I found out that the movie poster world and the making of movie worlds are two completely separate worlds. They do not intersect. Uh -huh. So even though I was doing movie posters, there, there were no offers to make any films or anything. Right. And a friend of mine, Bob Greenberg, he was a production assistant on the new Conan the Barbarian movie that was being made back in the late 70s. And I was intrigued because I was a huge Robert E. Howard fan. I had read all the Conan books. Uh -huh. And what really intrigued me was when I found out that Ron Cobb was the production designer. Now, I knew Ron Cobb as a political cartoonist for the LA Free Press. He also did a lot of the creatures in the cantina sequence of Star Wars mm -hmm. and designed the Nostromo for Alien. So Just I those thought, little projects. So I thought, what would Ron be doing with Kona? I'm uh -huh. really dying to see it. But I was so busy doing posters, I just didn't have time to get over there. Finally got a break in my schedule, but instead of going there, I went to the ABA, the American Booksellers Association, happened to be in LA that year. Mm -hmm. And it's every publisher and every editor in the United States all in one room. So mm -hmm. great place for an illustrator like me to come by and pick up work. Absolutely. I got there and the first person I ran into was Ron Cobb. <laughs> And he said, Bill, Serendipitous. you are my first choice of who I want to work with in the art department, but I have an agreement with the director, John Millis. He has veto power over anybody I want to bring in. Mm -hmm. Would you mind leaving your portfolio so that John can see it? And I thought, well, it might be fun to learn how to make movies. Totally. It would be cool. So I went in the next day, and John happened to be there. Looked through my book, remembered a Harlan Ellison story, Harlan Ellison story I had illustrated called Shatter Like a Glass Goblin, uh -huh. which he had loved. And then he... Uh, just handed the book back to me and started walking out the door and in very dramatic fashion, he said, hire him. So <laughs> I, I went in to talk to the line producer who told me what I would be making on the film is that originally they're gonna hire me to do storyboards. Mm -hmm. And I nearly fell off the chair laughing because it was about 10% of what I was making in advertising. But I thought, well, it's only for two weeks. Yeah. And I found out later that whenever you get hired on a film, it's always for two weeks so that if you're a jerk and you don't work out, you, they can let you go after the two weeks and there's mm. no hard feelings. Mm -hmm. So the two weeks actually turned into two years and turned into a film career. I've now worked as a designer on over 45 films. And also when we were doing Conan the Barbarian, John Milius was producing 1941 for Steven Spielberg. So our receptionist was Kathleen <laughs> Kennedy and Steven's office was right across from our office. So Ron and I would work on Conan during the day and then six o'clock, put our pencils down, run over to Stephen's office and kick around ideas with Stephen for his next project, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yep. <laughs> uh, that is so, so cool. 
cool. Talk about right place, right time. I know. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So I worked on Conan very quickly. I stopped doing storyboards and started doing the designs that Ron didn't have time for. And when the Dino De La Reni's family saw that I was doing this, they began to groom me to become a production designer and eventually became a production designer and designed. Well, I designed one film that's become a gigantic cult film called Return of the Living Dead with the that's, Tar Man. Yep. I was like, Jeff, Jeff yeah. right there. <laughs> and then I did Masters of the Universe uh -huh. with Frank Langella and Dolph Lundgren. Yep. Yep. And it's funny, every time you name something, somebody squeaks over. Yeah. Like all these, we're trying to be, you know, like, oh, our guest is we're being reverent, but everyone's like. <laughs> so, yeah, I got to work on Pan's Labyrinth with mm -hmm. Guillermo. And... Yep. There's. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Designed yep. a big bug at the end of Men in Black. Oh my the god. Edgar and, that's, uh, so that's amazing. First blood, lots of different pictures. Wow. Oh my gosh. And then even with all that, you've had time to design theme parks? Yes. I got hired by Walt Disney Imagineering and worked there for about two and a half, three years. Uh -huh. uh, designing new theme parks and all their properties. And then <laughs> got hired by Universal to do the same thing, and I would bounce back and forth between the two companies over the years. That's crazy. Anything of note in there? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> well, some of my first murals are there. Uh, Walt Disney's Animal Kingdom. I did three, they commissioned three prehistoric murals for that, including the very first reconstruction ever done of the T-Rex called Sue, who was discovered by a friend of mine, Susan Hendrickson. And I was literally just at Animal Kingdom like a really? month ago, and I saw that, and I love it. That's oh, amazing. Cool. Well, when I was doing the, the picture of Sue, the mural of Sue, I didn't want it to just be a T-Rex. I wanted it to be that particular T-Rex. So I called the preparators at the Field Museum mm -hmm. in Chicago who were preparing the skeleton for display, and I said, what are the pathologies? And they said, oh, you should see it. She's got scratches all over her face from fights with other T-Rexes. She's got a hole in her leg where she got stuck by a triceratops horn. She's got a broken tail. And so I incorporated all of that into oh the reconstruction. God. So that actually is not just a T-Rex, but it is that T-Rex. It's Sue. Oh. See, now I have to go back to Animal Kingdom and look at that mm. mural again and, and know that. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, my first two murals were for the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Wow. They depict life before the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last two murals I did after the San Diego Zoo saw what I did for the San Diego Natural History Museum, they hired me to do two murals for their new Elephant Odyssey exhibit. Mm -hmm. So the first mural shows San Diego back when it had elephants, when it had, and I also included about 80 other creatures besides the mammoths and mastodons. Mm -hmm. And then the second mural they commissioned is the same scene but today with the animals that are remaining, like black bears and cougars and badgers and things. Oh, that's, so that's, that's my so favorite cool. kind of work. If I could oh. do murals the rest of my life, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Wow. So you've also not only painted so many amazing places, but you've been to so many amazing places. Yeah. Uh, I used to be the biggest movie nut you'd never want to meet. I'd go to film festivals, I'd go to movie marathons where you walk into the theater Friday afternoon and don't come out till Sunday night and you're watching movies the whole time. So I was living in Hollywood, I was real excited, I was going to see a new movie and a friend of mine spotted me from his car. He said, hey Bill, what are you doing? And I said, oh man, I can't wait, I'm, I'm going to go see a new movie. And he looked at me like I was some kind of schmuck. He said, really? A movie? Man, two hours alone in the dark. You could be having so many you could be having your own adventures instead of watching somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And man, that just flipped a switch in me. From that moment on, every year I would schedule an adventure around the world. The first one was going to the Galapagos Islands and Machu Picchu. And in 1989, <laughs> I decided to go to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons was I had these beautiful photography books on Antarctica by the world's greatest photographers, and they all said the same thing. Try as they could, there was no way they could capture the color of what was down there because of the limitations of the chemicals and emulsions. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I don't have that problem. Anything I see, I can put down on the paper. This sounds like a great place to go because they kept raving about the incredible color down there. Uh -huh. To give you an example, I went down first on a cruise ship, and it was midnight. It was still light enough to paint. I was doing pastel landscapes. The sky went from a lime green to an apricot orange. The sea was mint green, and there were blue-violet icebergs in the distance. And to the left of the ship, there was an iceberg with a lemon-yellow light emanating from below the surface of the water. Just unbelievable. Wow. Most spectacular place I've ever seen. And I thought, you know, I can't go back home and, and not try to preserve this place for my kids and grandkids. Mm -hmm. 
And so I thought, oh, boy, one of the one of the reactions I had when I told people that I was going to Antarctica was, why would you want to go there? It's just a bunch of snow and ice. Or, oh, you're going to paint down there? Make, bring a lot of white. <laughs> you know. And it was Everyone's just, a comedian. <laughs> just so much more than that. Wow. And I found out that uh, the Antarctic Treaty that protects Antarctica was due to expire in 1991. Now, the treaty is extraordinary. It came out of, it was an outgrowth of the International Geophysical Year, a, a year of cooperation amongst all the world scientists. Mm -hmm. President Eisenhower did not want to see that spirit die when that year ended, so he created the Antarctic Treaty that states that no one owns Antarctica, all wildlife is protected, there's no commercial exploitation of the continent allowed, no mining, no oil drilling, and all information is shared. Even at the height of the Cold War, the Soviets could come to any of our stations, look at what we were doing, and we could do the same with them. So it was this little oasis of sanity in the world. In fact, when you're living down there, you stop reading the news because the rest of the world seems insane. <laughs> it's just, it's extraordinary. Wow. I later got a, an incredible grant from the National Science Foundation to go down and live in Antarctica. And I got to do seven scuba dives under the ice, climbed an active volcano, camped out in the dry valleys. It was just the most extraordinary trip of my life. So in, when I was on that first <laughs> ship, though, I thought, what can I do to convince the pub public that Antarctica is worth saving? And I thought, well, I'll do a one-man show of paintings depicting the beautiful diversity of life down there, the whales, the seals, the penguins. Mm -hmm. And just to make sure that every little kid drags their parents to see this show, I'm going to make half the show prehistoric Antarctica with dinosaurs. Oh. So as soon as I got back, I flew to Columbus, Ohio, and got a crash course in Antarctic paleontology from Dr. David Elliott. And I came back and started doing my Antarctic paintings. And after I'd done the first five, I invited the director of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County to see the paintings. And he knew about the project I was trying to promote. And uh, Dr. Craig Black came, saw the paintings. He said, you've got your show, and we will travel it for you. And they traveled it for seven years. Oh, my God. Just extraordinary, all over the world. That's and, amazing. Uh, ironically, the country that was not going to re-sign the Antarctic Treaty was the United States, even though we created it. And it was because the first President Bush, who's a Texas oil man, wanted to open it up for oil drilling, mm -hmm. which makes sense from his perspective, but not from mine. Mm -hmm. And so this, there's this little group called the Antarctic, Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, and they are coordinating all the activities of the bigger groups like Greenpeace and the Environmental Defense Fund and Natural uh, Defense Resources. They're coordinating all those events to make uh, Antarctica the very first world park which wow. basically means we extend the treaty forever and protect that continent forever. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's that's a big passion of mine. Incredible. Wow. I'm, wow. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so amazed by you and the life that you've lived. That's incredible. Um, Let me tell you about <laughs> my second scuba dive when I got trapped under the ice. Oh, wow. <laughs> trapped now, under the... Yeah. Scuba diving in Antarctica is the best scuba diving in the entire world. Mm -hmm. On a great day in the Bahamas, the barrier reef visibility is 120 feet. Mm -hmm. In Antarctica, the visibility is 1,200 feet. It's clearer than the air in this room. It feels like you're flying through thick air. So because of that, you can get very disoriented because uh -huh. everything is crystal clear and it yeah. hampers your judging of distances. So they have a rope going down to the bottom with flags on it so you can find your way back to the hole that you came into. Okay. So I was with a group of divers and we stopped at one place that looked like a likely place to go. It was called a seal crack. It was a big fissure in the ice that Waddell seals go in and out of. Okay. And the first two divers went down and about two minutes later they shot out of the water pursued by a big bull <laughs> Waddell seal. And so we found another spot that looked more likely. And they went down. This time they were down for about 30, 40 minutes. When uh -huh. they came up, I said, well, is it worth suiting up to go diving? They go, it's cathedrals of ice under there. And I go, okay, I've got to see this. Yeah. This is amazing. So I went down with two other divers. And uh, now they were doing about four or five dives a day. I, I was just doing one a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them signaled to me that she was cold and she was going back up. So she went up and I thought, well, I don't want to be the last guy to come out of here. Yeah. So eventually I, I swam over to the rope and went up the rope. But instead of the hole being there, it was a crack just big enough for my fingers and then 12 feet thick of ice. And I thought, did I do something wrong? And I went back down, went back up again, same way, same thing happened. I thought, well, this is my worst nightmare. 
I oh my god, my I'm air. like already getting like anxiety. <laughs> just I checked my air and uh-huh. my tanks. I still had half an hour. Mm-hmm. I, I got really good at just sipping the air. So I swam over to the other diver and through sign language explained the problem I was having. And she went, she pointed in a different direction. So mm-hmm. I followed where she pointed and, mm-hmm. and there was the hole. And what had happened was that the divers on the surface didn't notice that the current had taken the rope from the wide part of the crack down to the narrow part of the crack. Oh, no. <laughs> I was so happy to find that. Oh, hole. my gosh. Well, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Oh. I'm just, I need to calm down for a second. Okay. Uh, so um, I have to ask before sure. we get into your book. Um, you what's your favorite dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur man, it goes right back to King Kong with the T-Rex. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. I never get tired of looking at T-Rexes. Yeah. So um, I have a T-Rex skull in my living room. You have a, t- a real one? It's cast from the one at the Natural History Museum here in L.A. That's so cool. Oh. Yeah, I was like, how big is that? Like, uh, at the time it was found, it was the biggest T-Rex yeah. ever found, about from here to about the end of that table. <gasps> pretty, pretty huge. Oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> I, or I just heard little voices go, Jesus, oh my God, like around the studio. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I thought I was a collector. Boy, that guy's yeah. crazy. <laughs> no, I mean, we're all collectors here. Everyone <laughs> loves something. So we have this book called The Art of Will S- William Stout, and you can get, you guys can go to side.show slash art of Will Stout to pre-order yours now. This is the collector edition that is probably yeah. about. It's actually, yeah, well, I don't know if that one's out yet, but this one's out. This one's out, this one's for out. sure. Mm-hmm. I think this they still may the... be working on this one because there's so many so extras. Much, yeah, there's so much in this that it comes with. It comes with, um, there's like a sketch over here on this side. It has all of your fantasy there's a artwork. There's portfolio of prints. Mm-hmm. There's a whole special comic book that's all my comic book stories that <sighs> have never been collected before like that. I'm watching Challenger's face, like his, his like, jaw just dropped about this so this is so cool i know that this is available for pre-order on the website uh for sure and then this one is already available so um we if you don't mind sticking around have a q a from our live audience oh, that will be happening that. so um we have a short video break and when we come back uh we will have a live q a with william stout you're Ooh. watching sideshow live I love talking to my fans yeah <laughs> i could listen Alas, my poor naive mortal, you've been dealt a terrible lie. You dwell in myths of heaven as a place of hope and salvation, and hell as one of punishment for those not worthy of pearly gates. In truth, they are two sides of one vile, corrupt coin, as neither care for salvation nor damnation. Their reality is a place of cruel imbalance, where your mortal souls serve only to further fuel a war of supremacy that is never ending. Horrifying, no? Yet in the shadows lie another path, with one who deals in the cold currency of truth. He is death, the all-taker, His offer is simple. Look past your mortal fears and embrace his promise to restore balance to life and the hereafter. Accept sanctuary amongst the mourners of the underworld and fight with us. Our celestial masters must be made to see their folly to restore what is just. We will rise, conquer, and rule. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Sideshow Live. We are here with William Stout, an amazing artist and fascinating person (laughs) just in general. I could listen to you talk forever. Um, We have a lot of questions from the audience. So if you want to just get right into it. Oh, yeah, let's dive in. Awesome. Okay. Um, Wow. Um, 
First off, we're getting asked, you mentioned all of your Antarctic paintings that you right. did for that exhibition. Is there a place that they are, that people can see them still? Uh, I've got a few of them on my website, williamstout.com. Uh, most of them right now, the tour is over, they're mm -hmm. in my studio. I'm still working on them. You know, a funny thing happened when I was working on that project. I used to subscribe to what I call the pinball school of career planning, where boing, boing, just bounce <laughs> all over the place. I understand that. And then well. when I was doing the Antarctic paintings, it I had a feeling come over me that this is what you were meant to do. And I didn't have that urge to do something different after that. I had an urge to just keep doing more of these. Oh, wow. So I s created a goal of doing 100 oil paintings of Antarctica. And that will be for a book which will be the first visual history of Antarctica. Oh, wow. Okay. So, oh, my gosh. So, uh, so they someday. eventually will be available all, all on a book. one book. Oh. Beautiful. Yes. Um, Jessica's asking, has William ever been on a real dinosaur dig before? I have been on several real dinosaur digs. <laughs> one of the best was uh, when my Antarctic show was traveling, mm -hmm. one of the museums it went to was the Royal Tyrell Museum in Canada, mm -hmm. which is in Drumheller, which is where Dinosaur Provincial Park is. And they called me up because they wanted me to speak at the opening. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, if you wanted, we could bring you out a couple of days earlier and you could go on a dinosaur dig in Dinosaur Provincial Park. I said, oh, sign me up right now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So wow. I get there. It was, a, it was about a two hour drive from the museum. And I get there and we're walking to the dig site. And I am so antsy, so nervous because I can see I'm walking on dinosaur bones and I'm crushing them. And I'm thinking I'm ruining all this incredible research and all this stuff. And the paleontologist said, ah, it's just a bunch of junk. Where do you see what we got? And so he took me to the spot and he held his arms out like this. He said, okay, imagine two city blocks within right here. We think we've got 20 to 30,000 dinosaur skeletons here. And he's handed me a whisk brush. He said, get to work. And I go, what, what, a whisk brush? I'm, I'm used to dinosaur digs where you got to chip rocks and mm -hmm. it's really hard work and, and stuff. Like, and I'm whisking away sand. And in the first half hour, I find three centrosaurus skulls. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. Then I thought, wait a minute, this is a little too unbelievable. Did they seed these for the new guy? Is mm. this all a joke? Nope. This location is like that. They think that maybe what happened was there was a gigantic flash flood uh -huh. that took an entire dinosaur herd and into the end of a box canyon where everything got piled up, and that's why there's so many skeletons oh, there. Oh, wow. Okay. Because I was anyway, just going to so ask, was, like, why would there be so many dinosaurs there? Yeah. But Yeah. So anyway, they that, that was a fantastic dinosaur. Day. Wow. Um, what has been Mr. Stout's favorite movie to work on? Oh, favorite movie to work on? Well, the, the easiest was Masters of the Universe because the production was so screwed up, there's no way I could be late on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so that's... that was that was really fun. It was fun working with Guillermo mm. on uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, Joe Lombardo wants to know if you have any memories from Pan's Labyrinth or stories you'd like to tell. Yeah, well, my involvement with Pan's Labyrinth was actually pretty minimal. Uh, Guillermo said he couldn't afford me for more than a week because <laughs> <laughs> it was a low-budget little right. Spanish film. But I got to tell you, what happened was f I have a lot of mutual friends who are friends with Guillermo. And they all kept saying the same thing. Bill, you got to meet Guillermo. You two will hit it off. You're like two peas in a pod. It's unbelievable. But somehow we just kept missing each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, my friend Frank Darabont, who directed uh, Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. he used to throw a party every Thursday at Comic-Con at the best restaurant in San Diego and invite all his favorite artists and sometimes some of his director friends too. Mm -hmm. So he invited me and he invited Guillermo and he placed us so we were sitting opposite each other. Smart so man. We did hit it off. He came into my booth the next day and bought a couple paintings from me. Mm -hmm. And he said, would you mind delivering these to my home? I said, not at all. He says, I got a little project I want to talk to you about. So I drove, drove over to his home and uh, he began to talk to me about uh, Pan's Labyrinth, mm -hmm. my working on Pan's Labyrinth. And in the middle of that, he gets a phone call. So I hear his end of it, which is, oh, hello. Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm so pleased. This is great. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I am so honored. I am so honored, but I'm sorry. I, I will have to pass. I need to make my little Spanish film now. And he hung up. I go, Guillermo, what was all that about? He said, oh, it was Warner Brothers. They just offered me Harry Potter. And I went, whoa, <laughs> whoa, boy, 
it, wow, think about a different Harry Potter. My him just wow. shot way up that he blew off the Harry Potter franchise to make his little Spanish film. Oh, wow. That so impressed me. I thought, man, this, this guy, is, he's, he's the real deal. Yeah, man, and now he's an Oscar-winning director. Yes. So that's, wow, he's, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> so... We have a couple people asking if you're a fan of Jurassic Park. You know, funny thing, I received a <laughs> mysterious package in the mail one day, mm -hmm. and the note on top said, read this, but don't look at the last page until you've read the whole thing. I go, what is this? And so I start reading it, and I'm going, wow, this is an amazing story. This is fantastic, and wow, this would be an incredible movie. I mean... I should really be the designer for this because it's dinosaurs. Uh -huh. I'm the dinosaur guy, and I even know who all the characters are. The real people that he based the characters yeah, yeah. on is Jack mm -hmm. Horner, mm -hmm. you know, is, and stuff. And and theme parks. I just spent three years designing theme parks for Disney, mm -hmm. and I get to the very last page of this preview copy. It hadn't even been published yet. Mm -hmm. of Jurassic Park. And there's Michael Crichton's acknowledgement to me as being an inspiration for the book. And I thought, I am so screwed. Because <laughs> there's an axiom in Hollywood, which is the more perfect you are for a project, the less likely it is that you will do it. Oh. <laughs> but that was the, the whole only, room went, oh. <laughs> it was the only film I ever actually tried to get, which is another Hollywood taboo. Mm -hmm. You never try for anything because if, if they think you're interested in it, then they're they don't want to give it to you. <laughs> so, oh. but I did have lunch with the production designer of Jurassic Park, Rick mm -hmm. Carter, every two weeks, and I fed him stuff to put into the movie. Very cool. That's so. awesome. So then a follow-up question to this, if you could bring back one dinosaur, what would you bring back? Well, first, would you bring it back? Uh, yes, I would, because <laughs> I am dying to see what a Tyrannosaurus Rex really looks like. I mean, we think we know, Mm -hmm. But it could be so different. It mm -hmm. could be outrageous colors. Uh, in China, they found a Tyrannosaur had a big plume on the end of its tail. Mm -hmm. Do all Tyrannosaurs have big plumes on the end of their tails? I want to know. Yeah. yeah. And then you even, we were talking, because my favorite dinosaur is the Stegosaurus, yes. and we were talking about how um, they thought the tail was incorrect at one right. point, and you well, were for telling... For many years, mm -hmm. we didn't really know what Stegosaurus looked like. We we had pieces of stegosaurus. We had enough pieces to make a whole stegosaurus, mm -hmm. but how were the plates arranged on the back? Were they two rows of single plates? Was it one single roll of plates? Was it alternating plates? Yeah. We didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then a few years ago, they were doing a new high-ray construction project, and they found two what they call roadkill stegosaurs, completely intact skeletons with everything in place. And they found out that the plates on the spine alternated and over slightly overlapped going all the way down the spine but what really surprised them was the tail because we previously they had mounted the spikes on the tail like this well if you think about it that's not very effective as a weapon if you get hit like that mm -hmm. but if they were on the sides of the tail like that and they swung it you would get stuck mm -hmm. on top of that they they discovered something they had no idea about which was that the stegosaurus had its throat completely covered with silver dollar-sized bony plates, almost like chain mail to protect the throat. So this <laughs> my is favorite. my interpretation of that. I'll put this up here. And so you can see the, the little bony throat there and the alternating plates and the, oh, and the spikes, spikes coming out the side of the tail. Oh my God, I love it so much. So this I is may one of my pieces I, for dinosaur, yeah. Didn't cry. Almost cried, didn't cry. Yeah. Oh my gosh, one of the pieces for dinosaurs. Oh, my crying thing is if I watch It's a Wonderful Life, oh. I've seen it so many times now, I cry in anticipation of the next scene. I have movies like that too, yeah. definitely. Pre -cry. <laughs> hmm? pre -cry. He pre cries. He pre cries. <laughs> yeah. He definitely pre cries. Um, the username Toy Medic wants to know okay. where has where has been your favorite adventure? What was your favorite place to visit? I think besides Antarctica, because that was clearly yeah, a hands clear down favorite. Antarctica. Uh huh. Uh, Oh gosh, I love traveling all over the Yucatan. Mm, wow. And, uh, and when I was in Prague, I took a five hour bus trip to a little tiny village in the Czech Republic to see Alphonse Mucha's Slav epic murals. They had all the originals there. And I could get this close to the murals and look at them. Oh my God. I was literally pinching myself <laughs> because I thought, well, this has to be a dream. This can't be real that I'm actually seeing these after mm -hmm. all these years, but it was real. 
So Wow, so you're not kidding, like real adventures. These yeah. are like once in a lifetime experiences. Yeah. Oh my oh, God. Another great one was uh, Patagonia, the southern tip of South America. I mm -hmm. went to both Argentinian Patagonia and Chilean Patagonia. And I, I rented a car and drove over a thousand miles because they still have forests of Araucaria trees, uh, known here as monkey puzzle trees, mm -hmm. which existed, uh, were abundant in the Cretaceous. So it's very difficult to find them in their natural setting. So here were entire national parks I could go to and, and take photos of so I could use those in my reconstructions. Yeah. Oh my God, that that's amazing. That, wow. Um, okay, okay. Um, do you have any dream projects in the back of your mind that, you're, that you still would like to work on someday? Sure. Well, my most requested book is a book on all my music-related art. In the mid-1970s, I did a series of 45 bootleg record album covers. And mm -hmm. music collectors <laughs> are anxious to have those collected all in one mm. source. And I would have that along with all my regular stuff. I think the most important book I will do of my career will probably be my book on the history of life of Antarctica. Yeah. I think that will be a real solid book and hopefully Antarctica will still be around by the time that book comes out. Oh. It's melting really quickly and uh, the the ice over the center of Antarctica is so heavy and so thick it has pushed the landmass underneath it down below sea level. So when that melts Antarctica's, Antarctica is going to be two islands, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. Oh wow. And it's, oh, it's rapidly melting. I did not know that. Oh my gosh. Um, wow. They're just, now they're, they're asking about your your favorite of these statues behind you. We've decorated the set um, for, you know, William Stout. We put our dinosauria line behind us. So um, we have so many of these pieces are just completely unavailable because our dinosauria line was incredibly popular um, with all of us who grew, who grew up with dinosaurs and mm -hmm. dinosaur fans. So do you have a favorite of the dinosauria well, collection? I, I love this one back here, the sauropod being attacked by oh, the, the allosaurs. There are other allosaurs or ceratosaurs uh, because it, it's just so dynamic and full of action. As a production designer on films, I often hire a lot of sculptors. Mm -hmm. and, and what I look for in a sculpture is, does it look good from every angle? Not just the oh, yeah. one key angle that you see in the ads, right. but it should look good no matter where you stand. Absolutely. And boy, that's something that Sideshow does better than anybody. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, that's all the questions that we have. I just kind of like, we should do story time sometime. <laughs> just like yeah. hang out. William Stout can come hang out, tell us about his adventures, like mm -hmm. adventures with William Stout. We can mock up the Indiana Jones-esque logo. Yeah. You worked on Raiders, so yeah. it's on theme. <laughs> but So yeah. should I tell my favorite showbiz story? Sure. Okay. There we go. Let's okay. end with your favorite showbiz story. Okay. I was working on the remake of Invaders from Mars, a script by Dan O'Bannon, who I had worked with on Return of the Living Dead. The director was Toby Hooper. <laughs> Jeff. Yeah, I know. So, Jeff. so uh, we had contacted the United States Air Force about loaning us equipment and gear for the film. And uh, we hadn't heard back from them, and the shooting date was starting to loom, and I was getting nervous. So finally, I, I just called them up. I said, you know, the Air Force is going to help us out with the making of our motion picture. And the guy said, no, I'm sorry, the United States Air Force cannot cooperate in the making of your film. I said, why? You, you guys are the heroes. You're the good guys, mm -hmm. the military. You saved the day. You kill the Martians. You're, mm -hmm. what's, what's the downside? And he said, it is the official position of the United States Air Force that there are no Martians and there are no UFOs. I said, seriously? This is That's movie. your excuse? That's like, That's, <laughs> oh my. It, they knew that it was fake, right? I couldn't believe it. It's <laughs> like, oh, that, what, what are we going to do? Well, our storyboard artist, Keith Crosley, hands me a card. He says, call this guy. And it had a name of a guy and it said, United States Marine Corps Public Relations Liaison Officer. Uh -huh. So I called him up. He said, well, send me a script. And I said, I will message you a script. I'll have a messenger over there within two hours. You'll mm -hmm. have the script because we're getting tense. And the next day, I, I didn't wait any longer than a day. I called him up. I said, did you read the screenplay? He said, yes, I did. I said, so are the Marines going to help us out? He said, you will have the full cooperation of the United States Marine Corps in the making of your motion picture. I said, so there's no problem with the Marine Corps' position on, on Martians and UFOs? He said, son, it is the official position of the United States Marine Corps that the United States Marines have no qualms whatsoever about killing Martians. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that is amazing. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for being here. That's all we have for today. Be sure to keep up to date on everything that we're doing by going to side.show slash notify and turning those notifications on. You'll know every time that we go live anywhere. Thank you, You're William, welcome. for being here. Thank it was so me. awesome to talk cool. to you guys. Thank you so much for watching and tune in next time. Don't forget to let your geek side show. Thanks, yeah. guys. Woo! Hey everyone, welcome back to How To Be A Poser. Today we're gonna to show you how to use a figure with a whole lot of accessories. To do that, we're gonna be using the Hot Toys Batman Arkham Knight six scale figure. Let's get started. All right, here he is, Arkham Knight Batman, still in his box exactly as he's gonna to come to you. Comes with a wide array of accessories, grappling gun, batarangs, all sorts of wonderful toys. Can't wait to see what we can do with them, so let's get started. All right, here it is, Batman from Arkham Knight. The first thing I'm noticing right away is there's some really, really killer details to it. I mean, this carbon fiber looks very realistic. This rubberized suit is pliable enough that we're actually gonna be able to hit some really good poses with it, so I'm, I'm actually really optimistic right out of the gate. All right, first thing that I want to do is decide which tools that I'm going to use, obviously. And I think that for this opening pose, I've always been a huge fan of batarangs. So I'm going to use at least one, possibly two. No, that's not a batarang hand. Here we go, it's another batarang hand. So I've got two batarang hands right here, two batarangs. So we're just going to go to war with batarangs here. Out comes the wrist pegs. That one popped right off of the wrist peg, that's lucky. Okay, get these pegs into the hands and replace them in their homes, the arms. Now, before I do that, I wanna make sure that this peg is rotated in just the direction that I want it to be. And I'm gonna to wanna to cock the wrist like I like to do. If you've watched any of the other videos, I kind of have a tendency to bend the wrist inward. And this is gonna be no exception. So let's get that back up into the arm. Sometimes you need to just bend the figure and guide yourself home, just like that. Done. I'm gonna put the batarangs in the hands last. I wanna get this pose dialed first. I want this arm to be up and the hand to be cocked in such a way as he's getting ready to throw the batarang with that arm. This head's gonna turn this way. I'm gonna twist his torso this way. Get that leg out. Let's see what this does. Again, this is my first time just experimenting with this body and with a suit wrapped around it, which modifies how you have to work with the range of motion. So I'm gonna get this arm out there like he's using this hand to guide his throw, just kind of amplifying his line of sight. I'm getting close enough where I just wanna see where this battering is gonna play. There, that's in. Let's get that back, twist that hand just a touch. Winding up and getting ready to throw it. And I think that I wanna have this arm out just a little bit more. Sort of like he's cocking back, he's sticking his chest out as he really wants to power through those pecs. Oh, my antipectoral muscles. Just experimenting with the body just to make it look natural. I'm gonna to try to jut that head out there just a little bit. Now the armor won't let it go that much, but I think it's gonna do it just enough so that we can make this realistic. And let's go ahead 
and get this other batarang in his fist. Actually, I'm gonna try playing with this, like he's getting ready to throw one one way and the other the other. And notice the angle that I'm going for there. So if you tilt this down, you can see that this arm is kind of moving back towards the back of him, all the way back here. It's not at a flat angle to the camera. There's just a bit of a bend to it. That's desirable because it just pulls the eye in and it just doesn't make everything look squared off. Now, this is where the fun begins. Because as I've said before, capes are my kryptonite and there's nothing Batman loves more than kryptonite. I don't think it would be too strongly in one direction or, or another. It's not like he's just jumped back a lot and the cape has to catch up. Or, and it's not like he's jumping forward a lot so the cape has to catch up this way. So it's going to be kind of spreading out and, and the only thing that might be affecting it at this point would be the wind. So for this, and this is going to work in our favor, all we really need to concentrate on is making sure everything looks smooth and free-flowing. So to do that, just kind of work your hands down these wires, which are, by the way, not located on the outside, as they are typically to keep it are right here. And it looks like there's, no, there's nothing there. So it's just on the first pleat is where these wires exist. Have this one bending out just a little bit. I like what that does because it allows this first pleat to kind of curve over. And then you can bring this one out so everything's not looking terribly flat. And there's more wires down here. Yeah, there's one that goes right down the middle. So that's gonna allow you to bend that out just a little bit, and then you can play with the pleats. Just be a little subtle with it. Not overly dramatic. Just kind of compressing all three of these pleats, as well as the ones on the outside. Now I just wanna I'm just not liking how this is looking, so I'm going to straighten his legs, just his back leg, just a little bit. It has a dual effect of leaning him more into the throw. To compensate for that, I'm going to bring this arm up again, and I think that that's going to help us considerably, both in terms of balance and just overall overall posture. And so that arm just should not be straight to the ground, parallel to the ground, or parallel to the camera. There we go. Yeah, that's got it. The Arkham games have been thrilling gamers for years now. Even in the midst of all the action and dynamics of the video game, there are still plenty of moments of stillness and presence. Combine these two extremes to one degree or another, and you'll be able to find a wide variety of looks that fit this figure perfectly.
and welcome to a special edition of Sideshow Live. We have special guest Daniel Logan. Hi, how's How it going? going? Yeah, I'm super excited to have you in the studio. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome. I've wanted to do this for a very long time. Well, I'm glad we finally made it happen. Since it was Young Boba, cloning around. Young Boba cloning. <laughs> yeah, I've always cloning wanted to come. Cloning around, I love that. Hang out with the Sideshow crew, right? That's awesome. I mean, you're representing us with the nice Sideshow shirt and everything, so it works out. Yeah. Got my yeah. Sideshow, repping the Sideshow, yeah. and you're and repping the I'm whole repping entire repping dark Boba, side. So all the dark side guys in Empire, Boba's first appearance. What can so, I say? Yeah. Um, so a little introduction to you. You were born in New Zealand. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately. I'm a, I'm a savage, yes. Oh my gosh. We love New Zealand here. <laughs> I, I grew up with sticks and stones. That's what made Boba so... Uh, so just ruthless. Yeah, so great of a character to play because he didn't have any friends either. <laughs> so I know that I grew up on a water planet, but there must have been something he just played with. Maybe a little... Mm -hmm. Ants or rats or something. Yeah, put together his own, his first bounty hunter weapons with the sticks. I like the way you think. Yeah. We have to do a backstory on that. <laughs> Daniel Logan sideshow backstories. <laughs> <laughs> and you started acting at a young age too, besides just bounty hunting. So you started acting at 10 years old? Yeah, about 10 years old. I uh, I was a rugby player. Oh, wow. And um, I, an audition came at my rugby club and they asked if uh, my coach could put down two names from his, from his team. Mm -hmm. So him... Uh, he put down me and his son's name. Mm -hmm. Well, I went in, and the first thing they said was, oh, he's a little too too uh, white to play the character because I was meant to play a dark, uh, rugby, uh, famous rugby player. Uh -huh. So I, I uh, basically won the people over. So this lady asked me, can I dive into the ground like as if I'm diving into mud? And I dove into a concrete ground like I was diving into mud. And after she was like, oh, she was like, great, you got the job. <laughs> And that's how my whole career came to life. Wow. So just a dot. You I, dove into your career literally. I, I like how you said that. That's going to be the, that's gonna be the uh, title of my book. Yeah. Your Diving. autobiography. I like that. You're like, I gave him that. I should have yeah, copyrighted like, it. Oh, man. <laughs> um, you just have to dedicate the book to me. That's okay. okay. I'll, put, I'll put it on to the front side page. Show. Just that's all to you have. Sideshow. Yeah. Much love always. Oh, love it. Perfect. Um, but you, you're most famous, though, for your role as Boba Fett in Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got that role? That was pretty incredible. So I got into uh, Star Wars. I auditioned. Well, before I auditioned, growing up in New Zealand, going backwards, mm -hmm. uh, we only had three or four TV channels in each household. Mm -hmm. And we were in the break between episodes of uh, six and one where there was actually 16 years of no Star oh, Wars. Yeah. I remember. It was heartbreaking. See, I didn't because I grew up in New Zealand That's where right. we had no Star Wars. So when the audition came, my I remember my agent. I will never forget this. She called hyperventilating and screaming, basically telling me she has me an audition. Uh -huh. And I'm like, an audition? Like, what? So she was like, I got you an audition for Star Wars. <laughs> you know, and I had never heard of Star Wars at the point. So I was like, uh, okay, send me the script and I'll go for the audition. I was a little cocky at the uh -huh. time because I was booking every little thing in New yeah. Zealand. And uh, she turned, uh, she, she, uh, she, she replies to me, no, Daniel, you don't understand. Like, you're not going to get this role. Yeah. But we're going to forever be able to sell you as you're the kid who auditioned to be the kid in Star Wars. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> That's yeah, how, crazy. Well, what an ego boost, right? Yeah. Like, you're not going to get this. But. Just the fact you're auditioning for yeah. this. We're going to live on. We're so on. excited about the audition. Oh, we, we were going to use that for the rest of my auditions. You know, uh -huh. oh, you want the kid who was about to be in Star Wars? He was the second pick. And I've, instead. I got the role. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I found out later that I auditioned out of about 5,000 children worldwide. Wow. And um, I remember the day I went into this hotel room and my uh, grandmother and my mother followed behind me. And um, Robin Gerlin, the um, the casting director, kind of like halted my mom and my nana. And she was like, uh, only the boy, basically. So I uh, I went in the room and. We basically had a conversation like me and you were having now, but um, it was in a, a suite of a hotel room, and she was filming the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I started telling her about my life and what I loved and passions and, and you know a bit about my family and whatnot. And then at the end of it, she says to me, now, Daniel, do you have any special talents? <laughs> and I just went and rented the VHS of ep episode one, uh -huh. and I seen Darth Maul, and I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna be a Darth Maul character because during the audition process, there was never no lines to read mm -hmm. because no one knew Boba Fett was gonna come out. Oh. They didn't know until about two weeks before the film 
or three weeks, you know, everything gets leaked last yeah. minute. But uh, it was until the last minute that Boba Fett was actually going to be coming back in episode two. Those were the cool, fun Star Wars yeah. days when everything was kept secret to the very last minute or oh. was revealed on the film. And uh, I didn't know I was going to play Boba Fett. So when she asked if I had any special talents, I started running. I said, yeah, sure. Like, do you have like a broomstick? <laughs> Knowing that we're in the nicest hotel in yeah. New Zealand. She says, no. Um, why? And I said, well, because I can do this thing as a tayaha which is the basically the double-handed lightsaber. Uh -huh. And uh, she said, well, Daniel, this is Star Wars. Just pretend like you have one in your hand. So here I am looking like the Star Wars kid off YouTube, <laughs> running around, like, whoa, 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 pretending like I had the stick in my hand, like running around, <laughs> around the room. And uh, people ask me today, like, what do you think got you the role on that? I still think maybe it was like that Star Wars kid moment where I just let it loose and started running around the room and used my imagination. But... Uh, the original uh, Boba, Jeremy Bullock, mm -hmm. his his uh, the way he sees this is well. Think about having to watch that many videos, right? After about a thousand five hundred, George ne Lucas needed to go to the restroom or needed to eat, <laughs> eat something or just take a small break. So he right. paused, and it just happened to be my face that he paused on. Mm -hmm. Once he comes back, he's like, you know what? I'm done watching these kids. Just call this one. He would do. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm sure it was it was your imagination and being able I to create it. a world. Thank though. you. Yeah. yeah, as I said, it's my creativity, my creative uh, imagination. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so beyond just being Boba Fett on screen, you've also been able to reprise the role as Boba Fett in Star Wars: The Clone Wars, um, like the cartoon. Yes. Yeah, that was pretty incredible. And um, what's what's kind of different about playing Boba Fett on screen versus playing Boba Fett like through a voice where you're animated? See. When I got into the world of voice acting, I had no clue of that the talent it takes in order to be able to create a voice, bring it to life, and make people believe you are in that time period and having those emotions. Um, the first day I walked in, I had like this big watch on, this like this necklace and like <laughs> long sleeve, like scratchy shirt, right? Uh -huh. And they were looking at me like, hmm, <laughs> he's not really familiar with this business, oh is he? Oh my gosh. So, as I would talk, as you see, I'm a, I, I move a lot. Yeah, you're so, very animated. <laughs> exactly. I'm an animated person, uh -huh. and then I have to become animated with a voice. It's hard. So I would sit there and I'd be like, you know, one of the lines like, uh, like, I will get revenge for you, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. like, I'm sitting there, like, doing this, but the whole time the shirt's going up and down, scratching, and my ne my, my watch uh -huh. is, like, making this ching ching. So they're loving what I'm sounding like, uh -huh. but all the extra sounds and uh, background noise, it's killing them, you know? So... I learned from that. Next day, I went in with just a T-shirt on, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sweatpants so that nothing scratched. But um, having to take all of this energy mm -hmm. and hone it and kind of strap myself together and use it as a voice, it's very hard because I want to move. I want to take people on a journey with my body language. Mm -hmm. But with the Clone Wars, you had only a voice to do that. Yeah. And, you know, I think as the seasons went on, I started becoming more and more comfortable with the character and the other um uh, voice actors and and, the, and their characters to where he started to become Boba again, yeah. you know, and I started feeling that I was back in the boots again. Did you get to, I love that, back in the boots again, that's <laughs> great. Um, did you get to actually be in the room with other voice actors or were you just isolated by yourself? No, it was incredible. So um, the way that they did the voice work, uh, the voice acting and how it made it so powerful was that they actually got us all together in the room at the same time. Because, yeah, in the Clone Wars, Boba's part of, like, a team. Exactly. So you need that interaction. And with that the bond with, yeah. yeah. And then the way you respond with your voice is how it allows me to react with my voice, too. Oh. So that's what helped a lot with that, too. So when we got our script, you would have six, seven different characters in the room together who's in that scene. And you would just start reading the story together. Oh, my god! And, like, you're saying your lines, I'm saying my lines. And we're just creating a story together. Oh. Um, that ends up becoming an episode of The Clone Wars. That's so amazing. And, it, see, that speaks to how good that show was, too, oh. is that they were able to create that story, like, all of you together. So After 10 years of not, you know, then they bring it back. It <laughs> uh -huh. has to say something. It's really good. You oh, know? my gosh. A lot of people missed it. Oh, I, yeah. I was so excited about that announcement at Comic-Con. I'm a big Clone Wars fan. I was so. in Peru when I, I, it came out, and then, you know, I'm barely getting signal up in Machu Picchu, and I get this <laughs> bing, and I'm like, yeah, I know I was in the Clone Wars, but what? <laughs> and, like, it's slowly, like, you know, drrr, drrr, you know, the old yeah. day where it slowly uh, downloads so got the page. you your own scroll, so like, like, your own Star Wars what? scroll. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, what? what? And then at the end of the trip, I, I finally found out it's coming back, and I was pretty excited for That's it, too. Awesome. It's funny, though. I, um... 
the way I got the role was pretty amazing. I, I, I love the way I got that role. So when I first met Dave Filoni at conventions, I would try and buy his meal every time I saw him. If he was at the hotel, I'd rush down, try and give the money before he could, you know, uh -huh. try and bribe him for a job, you know? <laughs> and uh, a couple of years went by after me bribing him, bribing him, and uh, seeing him at these cons. And next minute, he, I get a call like, hey, do you want to come reprise your role as Boba Fett? We would love to have you on the Clone Wars. I was like, of course. Of course. So when I get into the studio, I say to Dave Floney, man, I can't believe all that bribing paid off and that you gave me a job. And he's like, what are you talking about? So I said, well, you gave me this job because I bought you those lunches and those drinks and everything, right? Like, how you out? And he's like, no, uh, matter of fact, we didn't know where to go with the storyboard. And we were sitting in the storyboard room and George Lucas opens the door, pops his head in and says, I want Boba Fett in the Clone Wars. Call Daniel Logan. And the only way I can explain is like, God's called you back to heaven twice. You oh know? my You're God. Like, yeah. Uh, so you had like the the maker himself be like, we want Boba Fett to God, bring Daniel Logan yeah. back. Oh my God. The God of Star Wars touched me again. You know, he pulls me back out. Boom. Oh. Come out of the dark, my boy. And I yeah, that's how I got that. That's such a great story. I love George Lucas. I mean, he really changed my life. <laughs> it's incredible. So we have a couple questions okay. coming in from our fans. Joe Lombardo would like to know if you What's still, up, uh, if you still train with Ray Park at all. You know, I've been traveling a lot. I just had my... Uh, uh, boy six months ago and I didn't realize how much work it entails to have to not only do conventions but do uh, films and travel for those and then come home and be a father um, but I love Ray Ray's like my big brother so mm. I, I think I started looking more like Jabba the Hutt's tail so he started like <laughs> calling me back saying hey buddy you need to get back to the gym like and he started posting on online so I do I, tr I train with him quite a bit um, I've trained with him for the last 12 years, 13 years, on and off. But because I live in Orange County and he lives in L.A., mm. there's quite a bit of difference in, in uh, travel. But um, he's basically the one who really taught me the double-handed lightsaber. Oh, wow. I know how to, like, do his flips. Um, he's taught me quite a bit. He, he's a very, very amazing and talented man. Um, and he's not only a, a great martial artist, but he's able to teach people so well, too. But I'm just very fortunate that we became, like, family. His <laughs> his kids call me uncle. Uh, Daniel oh, that's and great. my son calls him Uncle Ray, but uh, oh, he will be. But okay. <laughs> um, that's that's how close we are, you know. And uh, I was very fortunate he took me under his wing. And so then I have to ask: uh, Do you prefer the lightsaber, or do you stick to your blasters? Well, <laughs> depends on where I am. If I'm just taking a cool photo off, you know, the blaster is always the cool one, you yeah. know. But if I had to actually physically show off, then mm -hmm. it's cool to get a lightsaber in my hand and then bust out some Darth Maul moves, oh, you know, awesome. with spinning the lightsaber and people are like, what? But then they forget I'm trained by the well, Sith yeah. Master himself. Exactly. So yes. You never know in the next Star Wars movies, Boba might pull out a double-handed lightsaber. Like, where'd Who that knows? come from? Yeah, Boba might be force sensitive. He's still a little bit of a mystery. <laughs> you know, he's very sensitive. Oh, wait, wait, we're not going there. Are we? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like after his dad, you know, yeah. he's still in therapy. Oh, so speaking of that, um, <laughs> So Ian Thompson would like to know, did Daniel have any idea at the time how the scene of him holding Django's helmet will, would become iconic? And was oh. that scene scripted or did you improvise it at all? You know, Ian, that's a great, great uh, question. So the best thing about that scene was I had just finished getting off Geonosis scene. It's so yeah. funny, right? Yeah. I'm like, I just, I just got on, off Geonosis. I was on Geonosis <laughs> for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so we just finished those scenes and... They were like, all right, Daniel, thanks. Like, you can go back, get, you know, take your wardrobe off, you know, and get comfortable. Because we weren't allowed to walk around the, the, the um, back lot or the studio with any of our costumes on. Because oh. there was these guys who were up like on the, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were okay. taking these long lens cameras and they were shooting everybody mm. from the top of this. Uh, they would literally climb on the top of this sports arena, like a, um, uh, like a sports field arena. Yeah. Um, risk their life just to take these pictures. So we had to keep getting undressed, get back dressed, get undressed. Um, so I was going back to get comfortable, and I hear my God himself, where is my Boba Fett? You know, and I'm <laughs> like, huh? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, he's just back in here. He's just getting all his wardrobe. And they're like, oh, uh, tell him to get back in his suit. I, I need him for one thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, yeah. George says, yeah. So I start getting all the little intricate pieces back on and everything, and... Uh, he, we start walking out of the wardrobe room back towards the clay Geonosis uh, area because mm -hmm. that whole entire set was filled with a whole, like like a foot 
thick, deep of uh, clay that they had imported from somewhere. Oh, wow. It's amazing. They just had dump truck after dump I mean, truck. I mean, that makes sense. It's such a unique color. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And such a beautiful color mm-hmm. that, it, you know, you couldn't have done it any other way. You couldn't have CGI'd that. So um, he walks me out into it. He gives me the helmet and just says, hey, can you... Um, can you do this? But because he's a little older uh-huh. and his knees were obviously a little older, he gets down on one knee and, uh, you know, puts the head. He shows me exactly how to do uh-huh. it. So I'm like, okay. And I get stand there with, and I kind of look like I'm taking a number two, you know, and <laughs> I, I, I do it like that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. my knees are obviously a lot younger. Uh-huh. I can do the like yeah, yeah. crouch down and the, uh. yeah. so um, one take and goes, okay, thank you. That's great. I got what I need. And I'm like, oh, cool, thanks. So one Perfect. of the most iconic images from the prequels is you with that, and it was done in one take. One take. And wow. the thing is, and that's George Lucas. That's how George Lucas, if, if you're a kid and you need a little bit of help to see what you need to, or he gives you that bit of advice, you are able to run with it just because of the words he's able to tell you and oh. the way he can you know, describe what he wants you to see or do in, his, in a scene. So it wasn't until I watched the movie that, I saw Django Fett get his head cut off for the first time. Oh my god! I had no clue that I held this helmet to my head, and my dad's head was actually literally chopped out of it a second and a half oh before. No. So when I watched the movie for the first time at the at the premiere, I was the only person in the movie theater to cheer because he got his head chopped off. <laughs> so when 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 they came back later on and like, what, why why did you cheer? Because your dad got his head chopped off. Everyone else went. Oh, ooh. Yeah, I remember seeing that going. <laughs> I thought yeah. I thought in episode three, me and Django Fett were gonna be the two bad guys again. Mm. So when I found out Django was gone, you're like me. I'm the baddest bounty hunter in the galaxy now. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Actually, I, that totally makes. I sense. I was so greedy that I was just thinking of only myself that I was gonna get a jetpack on the next one. Oh, and I maybe did. a blaster, like oh they promised God. me on episode two. <laughs> Um, so for a lot of people, you are Boba Fett, like you're the oh. face of Boba Fett and it's your face under the helmet. Does that, um, is it strange thinking about that and how, and how did you grow into that role? You know, it's, it's, uh, being, being a huge Star Wars fan now <clears throat> and even bigger Boba Fett fan, um, for me, it's, it's humbling, but I still see Boba Fett as the guy under the mask. Yeah. You know what I mean? We don't know the face, but when George brought me to life and he gave the character a face, and then we continued on through the Clone Wars and, and you know, mm-hmm. I locked quite a bit more to f- through, mm-hmm. you know, it, it was an honor to become not only the face, but the voice of this generation and, yeah. and the last, mm-hmm. you know? Maybe not, not the original generation, mm-hmm. because they all... They all sort of like, no, Boba Fett should never have been revealed. He was a mysterious character where, you know, but I think as they're making more and more films, the prequels actually starting to get more and more respect and love. Oh, they're like, yeah. well, maybe that Boba kid wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> okay, I guess he is my Boba Fett now. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, I realized that you had to be, um, it, it, for me now, I'm an, I'm an ambassador of the new generation for this film. You know, wow. like I was a whole generation's Boba Fett that episode one, two, and three, that's what was their Star Wars. Yeah. You know, there's a new generation now that's they've gotten um, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, mm-hmm. Solo. Mm-hmm. You know, these are starting to become their generation films. Yeah. And then you have the original, which are usually grandparents or, or uh, older parents, mm-hmm. that is four, five, and six. That mm-hmm. was their Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And if you see between the periods, most of them are happy or not happy or whatever. There's a little rift between them all, but there's all such a, a collective called Star Wars, yeah. which we all can connect through, you know, good or bad. Yeah, that's true. Um, so you're heavily involved to, to that in in the fan scene, and you always take a lot of time to, to connect with the fans at conventions or even through your social media. Uh, is the fandom, the Star Wars fandom, important to you? Oh, 100%. Awesome. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them, and either would anybody. I mean, um, I've done conventions for 15 years, and I realized that there's only so many seats available at a convention, but somehow I keep getting invited back. But when you look around at a convention and you see a whole bunch of people that have done so well with their lives, but then they go to a convention and they don't even look up. <laughs> you know, it's like, hi, Mr. D. Hello. Uh, sign your autograph, and then they just push you along. You know, it's for me... Watching that from this side of the table, 
I always think to myself, if I was on that side of the table, I'd be like, well, where's the refund policy? If I buy anything <laughs> from Target, Walmart, like if I'm not happy with my sale, yeah. I think it was a little broke or wasn't uh-huh. thought what I got, uh-huh. you can usually go somewhere else and you can get a refund. Mm-hmm. You know, you can figure out how to get like store credit. <laughs> right. Uh, or they should say galactic credits, you know, but um, <laughs> I, I valued that to where I said, you know what? If I ever wanted to meet someone or my family ever wanted to meet someone and they did that to my family or me, I would be so heartbroken. Yeah. So I treat everybody as if as if I wanted to. Like I was just talking with my buddy Cullen, um, at one of the last shows they were at. Um, these people said to me, Man, it's so wonderful to see and hear you and tell stories. Um, you're such an ener- energetic guy and you just share so much. Well, I had a huge uh line at like Denver Colora uh Dem- Denver Comic Con or something mm-hmm. like that and I remember hearing this guy stand in line like, dude, just shut up already, right? So, like, I thought I heard him too. And, like, he was, like, maybe six, seven, eight uh-huh. people back, you know. And the people in front of me right there were, like, getting the best interaction, right? Yeah. But then the next guy got the same interaction. And this guy, so it takes a little long, right. a, a little while to meet me, right? But, he, I mean, when he gets to the front, he'll get that same that's, interaction too. That's what my buddy yeah. Colin said. He goes, you know, when that guy got to the front, he was so, like, overwhelmed by... I actually gave him the time too yeah. that it changed his whole um, uh, perce- yeah, yeah. perception of me in line to hurry up, stop talking to when he got there. He's like, well, like this was the best meet and greet ever. Yeah. He's like, I didn't just feel like I was a cattle cow. Now I feel bad for telling you to hurry up right. and shut up back there. And I'm like, Aww. it is what it is, man. I was like, my mom says I got verbal diarrhea. I just <laughs> kind of see it as a motor mouth on unfiltered thoughts, you know? I just want to sh- share with the world. Yeah, but it's great. Well, they used to be meet and greets. Mm-hmm. Now they're more like, how much money can I get out of these people and get them moved on the quickest, mm-hmm. you know? And um, that's why it kind of terrifies me with the future of conventions because if, if they continue the road they're going on, they won't last as long as they have, you mm-hmm. know? And I mean, look at San Diego Comic Con. It started as a, co- a comic collecting convention In where there was hotel lobby. Yes, you remember, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's you, it's the biggest thing ever now. Uh-huh. So, you know, as, as long as we keep creating uh, fun experiences like that, where mm-hmm. us geeks and nerds can go, yeah. you know, and not be judged or feel, you know, accepted in. It's our world, you know, and yeah. that's that's where I kind of give back to as well. So um, speaking of being a geek and a nerd, is it true that you have your own personal Boba Fett armor? <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's funny because I give, I, like, I think being having ADHD and, and being a girl man with it, I <laughs> still don't think. You know, so I, I called the Mandalorian Marks. I'm like, hey, guys, I've heard that you guys have given a lot of people who aren't a Boba Fett, like a lot of Boba Fett helmets. Like, what about the Boba Fett? Yeah. So it takes them years and years and years. And I think at the celebration or one of them, they finally, like, get me this one. But the guy, he's, it, it, the paint didn't sit right. Uh-huh. And um, I'm kind of like a guy, like, if I've got a Honda Civic, I'm going to be out there waxing that Honda Civic, like, uh-huh. shining it. Like, oh, yeah. that's my Honda Civic, uh-huh. you know? So there was, like, this helmet that i got given and it looked like someone after it had dried it basically looked like someone had cracked eggs all over it and then like had had it uh fried so oh, that no. it, yeah it just yeah. All, all looked like toothpaste had been sprayed all over it because mm. yeah the paint didn't dry right yeah so i take this around to all these conventions right and i'm so proud of it i'm doing photo ops <laughs> with it you know like hey, he's gonna hold my helmet and i have this one guy come up to me his name's nino and he's a uh, Wasted fat. Wasted fat, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> he comes up to me and uh he's like me, a little outspoken, I guess, and he's like, Man, I'm a little disappointed. And I said, Well, what are you talking about? He goes, uh, aren't you embarrassed? And I'm like, so he's starting off with these kind of <laughs> short liners, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, Well, bro, like your helmet it's kind of embarrassing, man. Like you're the <laughs> character and us fans have a better have better helmets and, and, and better armor than you have. <laughs> Um, I, I'd really like to make you one. Aww. And I'm like, what? Of course. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, no, bro. Like, I'd seriously like to make you one. So I was like, well, just being smart yeah. that I am. I'm like, well, s- while you're making the helmet, might as well make me the rest of the armor too. Oh my gosh. And he turns around and says, it would be my honor. I was like, what? That's so, so awesome. So then he's like, hey, can we, c-? and I, I mean, I had the Mandalorian Mercs come in and measure me like <gasps> 20 times, right? Like, I never got a flight suit. I had this one lady come to my house one time, Mark Katie. She, uh, she measured me. Mm-hmm. Within weeks later, she sent me back like a Cinderella fitting <laughs> flight suit. Like it's so beautiful. So I had all these guys like donating their time, their, oh. their talents to, to my build. And wow. like I, I want to say a ten, like 10 to 12 people or um, 
donated their time and 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 their wow. and their talents and i have the most beautiful empire strikes back um armor but um i have a couple more coming that's so cool i'm not really allowed to talk about it okay but i might have we a holiday it. special coming Ooh, yeah, so I was so the first exciting. one to say I wanted the holiday special, but uh -huh. because he's he knows everybody yeah. and he can paint, mm -hmm. he goes and builds a, a holiday special within months. And I'm oh like, my gosh. It's like, that was meant to be my holiday special. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you have a favorite Boba Fett moment? Um, That's a Robert Tremoli asked the question. Tremoli. Robert. Mm -hmm. uh, on screen or off screen? On screen, my favorite Boba Fett moment. Um, you know... I like the holiday special. That was like, I don't know why, but it was like, I, I loved cartoons growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, when you was uh, riding the big dinosaur. Oh, yeah. Um, I love that. And people give it such a hard time. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, I mean, the holiday special for a whole, uh, I mean, yeah, <clears throat> you can but that moment where you saw Boba Fett right before, like, the release of all the merchandise, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or at the time of the merchandise. Mm -hmm. It was just a perfect, perfect crossover, which yeah. helped him to move over forward into the, uh, yeah. into the clone, uh, into the, uh, uh, Empire. Empire. <laughs> <Just> okay. <laughs> uh, but you know what? My favorite moment, most people don't realize this, but my favorite moment was the day that they took him from being a super trooper and turned him into the Boba Fett that we now know today. Yeah. So most people don't realize, but back in the day, Boba Fett was, uh, as we know as a prototype Boba Fett, all white, mm -hmm. was actually going to become the super troopers, which was ultimately meant to be. This not, see, a guy who never saw Star Wars before he's in the film, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, I'm the biggest nerd now I ever. I, 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 this is all I talk with my friends now. Yeah, you know? I love it. Oh, yeah, but, you know, if, if Boba was to grow up this way, how? I don't know. <laughs> my poor wife, she's like, oh, man. Um, but so then they realize it'll be far too costly and way too time consuming. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, Gary Kurtz, I think, mm -hmm. ended up saying, hey, why don't we make this guy um, a standalone bounty hunter, yeah. which we all now today love and, and adore. Um, off screen, you know, every moment I got to spend with Jeremy Bullock, the fact is now he's in retirement. You know, uh, guys, he hasn't really been speaking about it, but he, he's, he's gone sick, you know, as, oh, wow. as we get older. Um, your body or, or your brain, they will start to take a toll on you and, and they don't work the same way. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to appreciate your youth and take, you know, care of your health and, and your mm -hmm. body. But um, he started with Parkinson's a couple of years back and it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And I think that um, as, as a respected man and, and bounty hunter that we will know him as, he wanted to leave the circuit before yeah. all of our visions were of that. Yeah. Um, and then we get to see that bright, wonderful man that we always love to go see because he was a friendly smile. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, that w those are the great moments, but also sad moment, you know, yeah. being so young in this franchise, all my friends are now starting to go towards retirement or, or, or the grave, you know, mm. and I'm just starting off, you know, and <laughs> my career just starting off again, and it's like. But hopefully, you can make new friends in the coming generation. It, it as will, well. you know. I'll yeah. become the originals, yeah. you know, to the to the new guys. Uh -huh. But you know, I you just can pass on what you have learned. Exactly, yeah. you know. <laughs> but they've they've all been so wonderful, you know. And, and Jeremy Bullock, I uh, I hope he does come to celebration just to come say hi, yeah. you know, not not if not even to sign, just to give us one last goodbye, you yeah, know, and like a hug. Yeah, I'd I'd love like that. Like a Boba Fett hug. Exactly. Yes. Um, and apart from Boba, do you have another favorite Star Wars character? My car favorite character, before I got to know Ray Park, um, my new character is kind of a Darth Maul, just because mm -hmm. I love what he introduced to the new generation. Oh, yeah. You know, that new lightsaber, it really touched a lot of people. I mean, the Kylo Ren lightsaber, they're trying to, you know, extend it and make a new one as well, but I don't think it took off quite like that, excuse me, the double-handed did, but Yoda was my, is my favorite. He was always my favorite. I grew up small. I grew up weird. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I didn't know how to talk. I, I didn't know how to read properly. Like, I had all of these, like, kinks that, that Yoda had in life. And I felt he gave us someone that we could say, hey, look, I feel like I'm parts of him, but he's still the baddest and, and the most deadliest Jedi in the Jedi Council. Yeah. You know, like, he's literally the strongest. Uh -huh. So if a guy who speaks backwards, a guy who's less than two feet tall, whatever, you know, if... If if he can be someone at such a high status, yeah. uh, status, then you know that allowed me to have possibility I could be anything too. Oh wow, I love that. There was this little kid, right? And uh, he um, he I just saw on the news before I came out here, and it just cr crushed my heart. I know what you're going to talk about. Yeah, he it, he'd been bullied. It broke my at, heart at school, too. right? Mm -hmm. And and they asked him back, like, why don't why don't you bully back or whatever, or why don't you get mad when these people bully you? And his response back was. 
it's not the Jedi way. And I kind of get goosebumps crying. too, yeah. I was brushing my teeth when mm -hmm. I heard that, and I was like, mm -hmm. oh. I just wanted to reach out to the kid and mm -hmm. hug him and tell him, hey, I'll put a bounty on anyone that picks on you, you know? Oh, but then wow. I was like, you can't write that kind of stuff online. Well, you should say, their bounties will get them eventually, buddy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> their bounties will catch up with them eventually, uh -huh. you know, something. But yeah. you have to be kind of political online. So yes, a little bit. I felt bad for the kid, but his response was perfect. I know. I oh. tell you, it's so not the Jedi way. Star Wars teaches such amazing lessons in, in it is. general. It's um, so to shift gears just a little bit, uh, do you collect anything? I do. I collect, uh, I collect a lot. Um, a lot of boba, actually. If you come to my house, there's a lot of boba all over I my mean, house. I understandably. Um, but, uh, I used to collect a lot of the Marvels. Oh, yeah. I love the Marvels. That's what got me addicted to Sideshow at first was the old, um, uh, Hulk busts. And oh my like, gosh. you know, yeah. it was, it was sad because you guys would make little busts, like the little one with, um, uh, the X Men one, mm, yeah. But I oh, I got like two of them. But I'd always break the the oh, the the, th the yeah. fangs off because uh -huh. it was so top heavy that it would fall off the shelf if you like knock the shelf, mm -hmm. and they would break. And that's when I was like, ah. <laughs> so then I buy another one. I did the same, and I'm like, ah. And that's how I I like to keep everything pristine. But um, <laughs> yeah, the Marvels franchise, the, I loved it. And then once. They started taking off with the Iron Man series. Uh -huh. I started relating so much to Boba Fett, even more so through Iron Man, because I was like, well, how could it, cool would it be if Boba had like a secret lair or a part of a slave one yeah. where he went into a side room and he pushed the door open and then next minute you have like all the different Boba Fett armors from the prototype to the holiday special to the Mantis, to, oh you know gosh. what I mean? To all yeah. these different uh, armors. That'd be so cool. Because there's so many different armors that mm -hmm. from the backstories you can go back to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the deluxe they just came out with with, with the two uh, yeah. uh, eyes, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And if you just had them all lined up, you know what I mean, ready to just get, get into. So you is know? that the future of your, your house right there? It is actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I walked in and I saw the whole entire display of the Iron Man, yeah. I was like, <gasps> oh, and now all the Boba Fetts. <laughs> exactly, I just revisioned them all, That's different amazing. colored Boba Fetts. Um, do you have another fandom that you're into besides Star Wars? I mean, you just kind of mentioned, answered that question. Is it Marvel or is it something else? Well, actually, my my uh, my love is for actually video games. Really? Yeah. So, what I'm, do you play? I, I used to play. Now, being a father, it's hard yeah. to get on them. But uh, <laughs> I was I was very good at Call of Duty for uh, very or, mo mainly. That makes sense. Uh, Blasters. Exactly. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, shooting games or mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. But. Um, I used to just sit on Call of Duty all day, every day, and I would be one of the guys who ranked from one, two, or three. I was mainly one or two, not to brag. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but then you get off, and it's like running a marathon, yeah. right? You could be the best marathon runner, and you're out front running the first, but you take a minute break, or you sit down for a second, there's going to be younger, quicker, like, you know, more stamina right behind <laughs> you. He's going to take your spot, and then uh -huh. it's going to get harder to get back in there. Wow. So that's why I've kind of, that's my excuse to be getting off PlayStation right now is because I'm finding it hard to get back into the race. <clears throat> um, we have another question coming in from the audience. Uh, T Birch 42 is asking. So Jake Lloyd and Hayden Christensen have been uh, have gotten kind of flack for their uh, roles in the prequels. Do you ever get the sim a similar type of negative attention or is it mostly positive coming from your fans? You know, I, I, I get it too. You know, I mean, back when I was young, I grew up and I was I was a rugby player and a, and a, uh, a boxer, you mm -hmm. know, before I started doing my schlats. And I had two big brothers that bullied me all my life. Uh -huh. I mean, there was no like bullying or picking on or beating up thing you could go to or to at a school and say, hey, I'm getting beaten at home or I'm getting beaten up at school. Yeah. You just had to deal with it. And you kind of went home with your beating. So I would have these like grown men at first when I first got in. I was like 15, 16. And uh, they would write like terrible things, especially the English fans. I don't know why, but they're so <laughs> brutal. So I would write back like, "Oh yeah, you want to fight?" <laughs> you know, like oh, no. I was I was a pretty like you know tough little kid. But right as I was about to push return, my manager would somehow feel the force of the dark side coming out of me, and that he would come in and be like, "You can't write that," and he would like delete, delete, and then I wouldn't send them. Mm -hmm. But it was literally just as I was pushing return, he would always feel like mm -hmm. I was online. Yeah. Um. So that's why I kind of got off for years because mm -hmm. I was like, well, I don't have to listen to this, but. I let my managers kind of run it, but I saw that it never really went anywhere with the following. It just had the same 2000. Yeah. Um, and I realized I had to start giving more of me. Mm -hmm. So I started getting on. Well, this one guy, 
he decides that he wants to take his time out of his day to write me a message and say, you're not the real Boba Fett. So I'm like, oh, all right, I'll check out this message, see oh what this God. negativity is all, all about. Right. So then he sends another message. You're just a kid. And then it has a, like a picture of my face when I open the door like, <laughs> right? So then he goes in and sends another message because I, I, I'm not responding, right? Uh -huh. and he sends this is the real Boba Fett. And he sends a picture of like, you know, Jeremy uh -huh. Bullock, you know, with the gun shooting yeah, out like, like this. Like that classic Boba yes, Fett yes. picture. <laughs> so I usually don't entertain this usually, but I'm like, man, I'm going to write something back. Oh so I'm God. like, buddy, I'm glad that you took your time out of your day to think about me in this way. <laughs> I really appreciate that you put so much thought and effort <laughs> into this character. And, you know, I, I kill people with kindness. So yeah. when people, when they write negative things, I'm like, well, thanks so much for your support. Or like with the new film and everything's yeah. being advertised, they're like, oh, Daniel Logan sucks. He shouldn't be him. It should be Tim Wade Marson, which yeah. was Django Fett. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I'm loving that. That's not an insult to me because I love Tim Ward and Marson mm -hmm. so much like a father. But I was the very first one to come out and push that he should be Boba Fett if I'm not him. Yeah. And people are like, well, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, think about it like this. He is the clone. Yeah. He's the, he, I yeah. get cloned from him. Mm -hmm. So I could, play, I could play him to his mid-30s, yeah. you know, maybe hitting you know, early 40s. But if he's past his 50s, 60s, he should be Django Fett. Yeah. You know what I mean? He needs to look like that. Exactly, yeah, right? And so it. people are like, oh, oh. Well, now people are using it against me. I'm like, oh, we don't want you to be him. We should think. I'm like, well, that's well, very good. I think that too. <laughs> when they come back around in like 20 years and they do a young Django Fett movie. There you go. Right? There you go. See, oh, the future of so Star Wars. It works. Yeah, Star Wars <laughs> is all about cycles. So speaking of that, uh, Vaspa803 would like to know if your son has a favorite Star Wars character yet. <laughs> Pretty no, young. not yet, young. but uh, I wish I could show you him. He's dressed in a he Boba is, Fett outfit. He is outfit. here dressed as Boba Fett today. So <laughs> I better be his favorite Star Wars character. I'll put a bounty on my son. <laughs> my son, But I you'll am... have to collect it because you're the... True you're the that. Yeah, it's, again, cycles and coming mm, back around. I'll just be collecting my own galactic cl credits. <laughs> I'll, I'll let him be, I guess. Yes. I hope he just, whatever he finds, he is able to take a positive um, outlook from the character and then and uh, apply that to his life. You know, that's all I care about. For me, Boba Fett's kind of got stuck with me. So, um, you know, I, I become like kind of a collector of money, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like a bounty hunter. I go yeah. wherever the money is, you know, yeah. to collect it. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm stuck with Boba, I guess. For Not now. a bad character to be stuck with. Not at all. But no, he's definitely gonna be a Star Wars fan. Um, oh, even when we were walking him through the hallway, he was like, he saw Ray with her lightsaber and like laughed. See, so I, like he knew. I'm the weirdest <laughs> father, so like he's been teething lately, so I'll pull out my Ray lightsaber and I'll sit in the dark and back. <laughs> <laughs> like, knowing all these things, I mean, he's just sitting there like, what a dad do I have? <laughs> Or like, I'll take him up next to my mannequin of Boba and I'll like let him touch him and, and introduce him so that when he does get introduced to the convention circuit, he's not terrified of all these people walking around in, in the outfits and the armors. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so I'm trying to introduce him early. Yeah. So he's ahead of the game. Oh, that's so amazing. Well, that's all the questions we have for you. Thank you so much for you joining so us. Very, this was very so welcome. fun. Hey, um, you know what? I'm very blessed to be able to come out and be a part of this today. Yeah. We love having you out and you can come back yeah, anytime. Yeah, make sure you keep up with the figures okay yeah if you're not with the new deluxe then you don't have the, the latest. <laughs> i know you need that new boba fett deluxe for sure it is beautiful i'm not gonna lie i mean i like how the fact that you took into consideration that people might want to change up the hands mm -hmm. you know they might want to change up this might want to change up that i don't want to give away all of it because you got to buy it to be able to see it because yeah. it's such a beautiful figure but uh yeah. Yeah. You guys do excellent, and thank I'm just you. very honored to be a part of it. Thank you so much. And thank welcome. you all for watching today. Yes. It was really awesome. And uh, tune in for more episodes of uh, our special edition of Sideshow Live. So thank you guys for watching, and don't forget to let your geek sideshow. And thanks for your questions. <laughs> Have a great day. May the dark force be with you all. The dark force? <gasps> oh, sorry, the light force. <laughs> <laughs> like, May the force be with you. dare you? <laughs> 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 thank you guys for watching. <laughs> Bruce Timm's art just had such a huge impact on people because it was just so different, so new. It was a language of line work that was unlike anything people had seen at the time. DC Animation just really kind of exploded, expanded. It was a huge inspiration. The designs, the storytelling, even the animation, it's just so unique.
the representations on the show were everything that you loved about the comic. It gave a whole generation Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman to know and to love. Line work and silhouettes, no matter which angle it's drawn at, you could see in the show that it creates a sense of movement. So we wanted to kind of capture that energy and bring that energy into a three-dimensional form that's representative of the feeling of the cartoon. We're starting the line with Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. And with DC, we always default to the Justice League Trinity because it covers so much. We didn't want a static presentation. We really wanted something that not only captured the style, but captured the animation. It's kind of meant to embody the best attributes of each character. Translating any 2D art, especially art that fans hold really dear, turning that into 3D is always a challenge. You always have to check your lines from every single angle, every step of the way, because one contour from the front it looks totally different when translated in 3D from a different angle. During the show, the style started to change, and we just wanted to take bits and pieces of everything and make the idealized version of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. We're just doing a little highlighting and shading to sort of give them a more three-dimensional feel, but I think from any angle you could take a picture of it and it would look like a still from the show. We wanted the base to be very specific to that character and their storyline. Much more representative of the backgrounds in the show. Splattered and stipply, kind of creating tonal maps and shadows rather than more subtle paint on the figure. I think we've taken the art and found a fun, new, unique way to present it. The collaboration aspect on these things is, it's amazing. Pretty much everyone involved has an intense love for these characters. I'm hopeful and optimistic that our fans will find the joy in these things as much as we have. The sense of action, I think, is really what ties them all together. It's been great watching the main trinity kind of come to life, but I think fans will be excited to see which characters outside of the trinity may be coming up. One of the things that I really... Santa thing since we're coming up on the holidays and it's really exciting. We also have a couple of really awesome 
gifts for you coming in the form of first looks and special features and guest Olivia. We all love having Olivia in house and she'll be here to talk about her Aquaman permission to come aboard art print. And we're very excited to talk to her about that. Uh, we also have the She-Hulk statue that debuted this year at New York Comic Con. That's part of the Adi Granoff artist series and it is so beautiful. So we'll be taking a first look at that up close and personal. Because it's the holidays, we all know that even though it's controversial, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. The writer said so, so sorry guys. But um, the Die Hard Illustrated Edition book reading with Steve Bloom will be played during this, seg this show as well. We will have a live Q&A with everyone who is here in studio. Uh, we are gonna answer some fun fandom questions for you at the end of the year. Plus, obviously, Olivia will be doing a live Q&A during her segment as well. And Olivia's always awesome with all of her questions, like answering all the questions. So let's get started. First up, as always, we have our featured collector. This week it is Ramil Yao. Ramil Yao. Oh my gosh, look at you. You're Hulk. Wow, that is a gorgeous Spider-Man piece. Look at that with your with your collection. Oh my god. Those shelves are rad. Wow, Ramil. That's really cool. So I'm just really impressed with his collection. You gotta let me know where those shelves are. That's really fantastic. If you would like to be our next featured collector, you can be featured here on the show and also in our blog. Head on over to side.show slash blog and click the apply now button. So guys, major things happening in pop culture this week. The Aquaman movies coming out, the Bumblebee movies yeah. coming out. I feel like Challenger is super stoked for the Bumblebee movie. Do Are you really, really excited? Yeah. Do you have your tickets already? Not yet, though. What? I know. Oh, you can't be that excited yeah. if you don't have your tickets. Hey, I'm busy Christmas shopping. Okay, that's fair. Fair enough. Fair, that's fair. Um, I know that a bunch of us in here have already seen Into the Spider-Verse, which if you haven't, go see that. It's so, so good. I loved it so much. I love the Octavius. Thwip, thwip. Love Doc Ock. What? Uh oh, spoilers! <laughs> um, I love Spider Gwen, and she's in the trailers, so y'all know she's already in it. But um, good job, Sam. Oh wait, crap! I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, slow clap for Sam, everyone. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry, Brett, who's probably one of the bigger Spider-Man fans in the room who hasn't seen the movie. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you guys have seen, have not seen Into the Spider-Verse, please go see it. If you have, I would love to chat with you guys about it. So um, maybe I'll make an appearance in the Facebook group a little bit later if you guys start a thread. If you guys aren't in the Facebook group, you should go in there. It's the our Let Your Geek Side Show Facebook group. Bree's in there. Buffy's in there. I'm in there sometimes. Terry, our poser's in there. We have lots of Sideshow staffers in there, plus some really rad people. Um, and yeah, all of you. So welcome. Um, all right, we have a short video break and when we come back, we will probably, we'll be, you know what, we'll surprise you. You're watching Sideshow Live, we'll be right back.
<laughs> hey everyone, welcome back. I was doing my best She-Hulk. I don't have the gamma radiation. That's what we'll call it. The gamma radiation in order to be She-Hulk. Um, this is our She-Hulk Adi Granoff Artist Series statue. Um, she debuted in New York, which makes complete sense to me as she is a character native to New York. Um, there's so many great little touches on She-Hulk that we just were really excited to debut her in her home city of Manhattan. And, but, oh, she looks so good, guys. So this is a one-fifth scale statue. Most of our artist series statues are that, but not always. It really depends on the type of art that we're getting. She is about 17, not seven, 17.5 inches tall on a New York City themed base. She has a ripped off taxi door, hydrant spilling out water, there's a drain, there's a pizza rat. You guys, this doesn't get more New York than this. She's an all sculpt piece with no cut and sew, um, but she is mixed media in other ways. To, in order to get the specific effects, we have to kind of mix media around with pieces like this. Her exclusive is a is an alternate classic portrait. She runs about 450 USD. I'm gonna stop spinning her so you guys can get a really good look. And if you would like to pre-order her right now, she is available at side.show slash she hulk statue. That's side.show slash she hulk statue. I'm gonna get my hand out of that awkward shot. Um, anyway. I am so in love with this piece. I love all the little Easter eggs and nods to not only New York, but She-Hulk uh, she herself. And of course, Adi Granoff's nod to a classic She-Hulk cover. Um, his artwork is just so amazing. I'm so impressed with this series. I can't wait to see what he comes up with next. She is the second in his line after the Iron Man extremist statue that debuted in San Diego uh, this past year. So yeah. Oh my God, look at that face. I love it. I love it so much. What a great, great, great She-Hulk statue. What do y'all think in the room? Thumbs yeah? Up. yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, we're gonna give her like a little, a very nice clap and also a big gun show. Yeah, yeah. I don't really have any, I don't have gamma radiation guys. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's not happening. Anyway, um, you guys, we have a short video break for you and then we'll be right back. You're watching Sideshow Live. just got here. Hi, how's Hi. it going? It's going great. It's so good. I'm so happy to see you. I can't talk. I'm just like, I'm really excited you're here. Um, so this is, we're talking about Aquaman today. Yeah. Mucho macho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, this is the Aquaman permission to come aboard art print. That wasn't my title. Who, really? Who came up with that? I know, it was so great. We, we used it. I don't know if I can say. <laughs> you don't know if you can say who came up with it? Okay, that's fair. That's fair. All right. Um, Aquaman will save you. Aquaman himself will will come, will come aboard great, and save it's you. A it's great such class. a great it's title, a though. title I'm, for it. No. <laughs> no worries. Um, we, so, okay. First up, how, this is the original, correct? Yes. 
That's pretty good. <gasps> wow. wow. Oh my gosh. I'm. I'm not so... saying a word. It's you know. You, you, you can you say can anything say you nothing. want, girl. <laughs> I can't wait to see the movie. He's amazing. Yeah, I'm really there's, excited to see the movie too. It comes out tomorrow. I, for Prime members, it was already out, but I didn't actually get to go see it during those Prime showings. There's something really special about him. He's really cool. He's got some magic stuff. I loved watching him <laughs> do the haka at the premiere. Did you see that video online? I saw a little bit of him dancing down yeah. the premiere. He's got a personality yeah. that's just And infectious. he just got the whole, yeah. like all the men of the yeah. cast and then also he, his children to do this traditional he's dance. He's a party. He's a party, that's true. <laughs> it's a party. Yeah. It's so a what party. was it like to um, to paint someone well, like him? Well, I had twice as big as I usually paint. <laughs> because he's a lot of man. It's a joke. It's a <laughs> joke. Mean, Anyhow, he kind of is. He's very, he's very tall guy. and big and muscular and yeah. Well, I mean, the decision was. I had all these great pictures of him that were given to me with his outfit on, and the outfit was really sparkly and amazing. But but he's not wearing the outfit but, in what you painted. But <laughs> somehow I didn't want to see that outfit on him. <laughs> I mean, and all the ladies here didn't want to see it either, so I wasn't the only one. I don't think so this, this is exclusive to ladies. I the, think he kind of transcends. I don't know. He's that somehow the the gold outfit isn't as spectacular as he is. <laughs> That's a quote right there. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's just he's just a pretty damn amazing. But when when. You are correct. He does have so much personality that he brings to everything. Oh, it's everything. ridiculous. So <laughs> how do you capture, you somehow are managing to capture the strength of the character, but also what Jason Momoa brings to Aquaman, which is a little bit of a different Arthur Curry than we're used to, because Arthur Curry is usually very blonde and very like light and kind of funny. And Jason Momoa, while he is humorous, this is, is what is, he should look like. He's just very. This is what I see Aquaman looking like. Aquaman should come from the sea. I mean, he's Hawaiian. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he looks. He's like an Islander. He Pele uh, mm -hmm. birthed him and, and threw him in the sea, and, and there was it like, is. "There yeah. you go." But yeah, he's perfect. How do you? But how do you um, capture some someone like this? Like, where did you start? Did you start with? Trying to capture the personality. Those trying damn to... tattoos is where I started. It drove me crazy. Really? <laughs> you well, know, they're... they're fun. I love painting tattoos, but yeah, these were a lot. Yeah. And, you know, and then they go in and out. Anyhow. Uh, <laughs> he's, but, uh, oh, you know, he's just got, he's just really sexy guy. You know, he's got these, this great scar on his eye that I love. Yeah, the scar is fantastic. I almost think they did that on purpose. Yeah. Now you guys remember you you can go in the chats and ask Olivia questions, including questions about. Go ahead, ask me questions about Jason Momoa. Well, I was also <laughs> going to say, besides Jason Momoa, um, you recently were featured in L.A. Weekly. Oh, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> you can ask her questions about that as well, and it it had like a very nice spread of all of your work across the years. So how how did that feel to see it all like in one place? Like well. <laughs> Besides, like your house and your studio, like you know what I mean, like and or a show, but just in print, just being well, you know, featured in something like LA Weekly. It's my local. It's my 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 home, Los Angeles. So it was really great to see it. You know, to, to be on the cover, and you know, uh, no, I was really happy. That's happy to see it. Amazing. I'm having a little bit of trouble connecting to the live chat um, in order to get the questions, which is making me sad. So, um, if you guys, if there are questions, what? you might no have Momoa to. questions? Like, what? So, um, this is, can you hint at a little bit what um, you might have coming up next with us? No. No. Good girl. Why do you ask? I don't I know. Always I always have to, I have to ask. It's just, you know. Um, but we have Jason Momoa. Maybe the last time you asked me about this, I mean. David and I go. We're sitting here, and he well, said, "Well, he uh, is trouble." It, it, yeah, and it was something he said. It's, vi it's fishy, or something like that. Kind um, of gave is, it away. It was beefcake. He said beefcake. He did beef say cake. beefcake, and he did and say fishy. I said it's yes, but yes. Um, so you're right there. 
Normally, you're here with a lot of female characters. Well, I'm going back to the ladies. I've got some I See? classic I icons coming. That, See? that actually classic. You actually said you didn't know me. and couldn't say, and now we're getting into classic icons. There's a lot of classic icons. That's but true. These were women that were particularly uh, my some of my uh, heroes. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Um, Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell. No, no. I was like, Tinkerbell? <laughs> no. Tinkerbell's one of your heroes? No, really? Just that surprises I'm me. Not painting Tinkerbell. Okay. But so what? Miniature. Miniature painting. What? I was just wondering, because um, you painted the Joker, and the last time you were here, we were talking about the Joker, and now we're here talking about Aquaman. <laughs> Is there like a theme to the men you choose to paint? No. <laughs> I don't know how it happens. <laughs> Somehow I thought the Joker. I said, oh, I'm not doing the Joker. I can't. But you did then, so amazing with the Joker. And then I got into him. You know, I think the, 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 uh, the theme about the Joker is that he's, I kind of painted him, I found him sexy in a very sick way. So. I love that kind of sick, sexy kind of guy. Anyhow, and this guy is just plain out there. There's just no, it just. There, it's unrolled. Sorry, you know, I was like unapologetically <laughs> sexy, and I mean he's very serious right here, looking for permission to come aboard. But if you if you see him moving around and acting, you know, in Saturday Night Live and all these things, I mean he's got a great sense of humor. He can dance. He can can do everything. Climb. He can do everything. So now we're finally getting questions coming Perfect. in from the audience. I've yes, been connected. Yes. So. Kevin would like to know, did your work at Playboy help you tackle his perfect pecs? <laughs> you know, a lot of people did complain that since I get censored uh, on, on social media, that his pecs were out there and that they did look remarkably similar to a woman's. <laughs> so it did help? Did it help? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> Not His at all. Were a whole he different doesn't story. have any of the elements uh, of what I've been painting all these, but it is beefcake. Yeah, it is. It's beef a lot cake, of beefcake. Cheesecake, you know. I Everyone's mean, asking about your original title for the painting. Uh, can I tell who titled it? It was your title. It was okay. It was my title. <laughs> I, had, I actually, yeah. Well, you know, we're all joking about it, you know, and then all of a sudden they said, no, you wouldn't title it that. Yeah. And they, they okayed it. They, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there's no doubt the guy is just um, very pretty. So we're also getting asked, is this the only Aquaman that you're ever going to tackle or will we see more um Momoa. In More your future, Momoa, in your yes. Future. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and um, then, what is the difference between painting a strong woman and a strong man? Well, I relate to the women, but the men are just mere sex objects to me. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> so the women, you're like, I'm. It's all in the eyes with the women. That's what we talk about. It's when all in the eyes with the men, too. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, I without it. this mentality that he has, he, he, he really, there'd be nothing there. Yeah. I Have mean, you seen online how he does those really funny pictures with couples? Look, where, like, if you get a photo, great. if you get a photo op with him and you're in a couple at a convention, he'll push the dude aside and like dip the woman. Oh, he's fabulous. <laughs> he's going to be around for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's just really, he's, he's really awesome. He's gold. Um, oh. So, what are some other characters that you would like to tackle in the future? Ah. Oh. I don't, I don't know. You always get asked this question, and you always have trouble with it, but I have to ask it. Um, We're getting a thumbs up about something. Hints. About what? Give me a hint. You Thumb need some hints. Uh -huh. What are you painting? What am I painting? I thought you said I couldn't say anything about You can those. hint at it. Oh, well. Did they actually give the title of the movie? <laughs> Oh, I know what you're painting. What? I just what? figured it out. What? What? Are we talking about like better, faster, stronger? Like that type of painting? Anyway. I don't even know. We'll what talk that about is. it later. Um, so, 
So, um, I don't do you have gets any, angry if I say what it is. Do you have any future artwork for anything Dungeons and Dragons related, like fantasy artwork? Is what we're getting. I at. do not know what that is. I am <laughs> perfect. Uh, it I'm, is. It's I'm a older. Fan, it's a older. fantasy role playing game. I have no idea. Okay. You know why everyone so my was doing the no. fantasy role playing? I was almost cursed. Uh, work. <laughs> I was working. <laughs> um, what genre do you like to paint the most? Do you like to do superheroes? Do you like to do sci-fi? Because you've done Leia, and that's a whole different type of strength strength in a woman besides Wonder Woman. You know, like Wonder Woman and Leia are completely different kinds of strong. Well, Wonder Woman was new. She mm -hmm. has a very interesting history from the back, which I didn't know from the years, from the 40s, which I didn't know about. But um, I don't know, I really love the, the painting, some of the icons that, I, that when I was in my 20s, I, I, that really made a difference to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, like I, I can't say them. <laughs> I don't know. They were, anyhow, so I mean, they were strong female, and mm -hmm. so it's... Uh, so I guess that's science fiction. I, what, what am I? What I think it sounds like you're talking about real life strong women. Oh, well, then it's not a real life situation. It's not real life? It's science, uh, science fiction. Okay, okay, cool. Awesome. Science fiction, but I, I like the, some of the superpower uh, ladies, but it's hard to have all the things that they have, paint them I mean, and then have all their stuff light up. <laughs> There, I mean, everything. you did an excellent job with your series of Wonder Woman paintings because you were able to show different parts of her in the different prints and paintings that you did. So you had one and of her like on a battlefield, but one of her like very posed and it was really fantastic. I will continue to paint her because she's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And she's yeah, and she's an important icon. Um, these ladies make a difference. It's good to see them. Oh, I love that too. Um, uh, what advice do you have for someone who's just starting to paint? Oh, just starting to paint? Well, it's, I mean, if, if there, you have to work every day. You have to work, even if you have to work your discipline up. Mm -hmm. um, don't stay. Is this a woman? Um, it's William, so my guess is no. Okay. <laughs> A woman named William. No, mm, I mean, um, no, no, no. Well, hey, in Star Trek Discovery, there's a woman named Michael. So the reason I ask is because the women tend to sit home with it. They don't go out out of the door. They 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 hide it. So so my suggestion is you have to get out and uh, start moving it. See where it goes and take any job uh, drawing that you can get and. Uh, you know, if you have an idea of where you're going to go, be surprised. It's going to take a lot of different routes. Just keep working. Keep working. But like the that. discipline thing is the most important thing. Don't wait for inspiration. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just, uh, you work. The process gives you the inspiration. Oh, oh I like that quote, too. The process gives Stole you the Stole it from all the best people. Well, we're going to steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nikki says she's a big fan of you, Olivia, and would you ever consider doing Betty Page with the Rocketeer? I don't know. You know, that is a licensed. Yeah. So I would need permission. Mm -hmm. Dave Stevens was a, an, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, but he, you know, passed about, God, about eight years ago, I think. So oh. maybe, maybe it could happen. Yeah. It all depends. A lot of this stuff depends on rights. Mm. I don't tend to do to paint anybody unless I have uh, permissions. Mm. So then that goes for the people asking if you're going to paint him as Khal Drogo from Game of Thrones. Oh, yum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Igo would want that as well. He'd probably want the painting. He wants anything. <laughs> somebody, he wants everything. Somebody gave me a Hodor uh, doorstop. <laughs> oh! It's the funniest damn thing. <laughs> so. That's amazing. It um, is. So, some, Frederick is saying, Olivia, you did work for heavy metal. Would you ever paint more heavy metal covers? I think there's one uh, in the queue right now in, in oh, yeah. March. In, in the, so I'm not allowed to go. say what it is, but there is one coming out. And yeah. I'm excited to be back on on their covers. I had like 14 covers. That's awesome. It is. And 
Uh, Olivia, have you ever done a self-portrait in a pop culture theme? Not interested. <laughs> there you go. Not interested at all. Now I'm, I'm reaching across you to get this. Where can someone pick this up if they want to learn more about they you? They can't. And they can't. They could probably go down and uh, find them on the street somewhere. Um, yeah. You can't get them anywhere? Take them off the Wow. Yeah. They're I mean, in shops or in like a uh, Whoever stall stole them. Yeah, the, yeah. They're hard to get. They're up for a week. That's why it's called. Weekly. So then now it's gone. My week of fame is over. They're free. You, know, you just grab yeah. them. Oh, things. see, I just read it online. Yeah, Did that's you? what the modern people do. They, <laughs> you have to go, you have to go so find the old people. So you can go read people. it online go at laweekly.com, I assume. Go to grandma's house and see if she's got it underneath the Yeah, laweekly.com. The you know, there you go. <laughs> and scroll through. Or I'm, I'm sure if you search Olivia's name, you can find it. Week's over. Yeah, but... Online, there's an archive of it. It'll exist. It'll exist online. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Well, we'll, trust me, our fans will find it online. So it's Beyond Pinups. It's all about Olivia. And right now, you can get the, uh, I almost called it the Jason Momoa armrest. <laughs> What's on your head? Yeah, what I know. The, uh, mine? <laughs> the Aquaman Permission to Come Aboard Fine Art Print. It is officially licensed by Warner Brothers. Hand numbered, limited edition of 200 pieces. It is hand signed by Olivia in gold ink because he's a, the king of Atlantis and that's his color. One of them. It is a 17 by 22.5 fine art gicle print double embossed with seals of authenticity from both Sideshow and Olivia's art studio. Um, and it is $400 framed USD. And right now it is only available framed. On Friday it goes up. If there are any available, this is a 200 edition piece. So it's going to be, uh, and it's, in the, it's you, you doing Jason Momoa. So I wouldn't wait or count on it being available on Friday, but you know, if you're lucky, it will be 190 unframed and you can pre-order it now at side.show slash Aquaman art print. Side.show slash Aquaman art print. Man, that is one gorgeous print. print. Well said. Print. Good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotta, Thank you so much for coming it. on the show. It's always wonderful to have you. Very respectful. Yes, we're being very respectful and very good. So you're watching Sideshow Live. We be very will good. be right back. <laughs> Is it off now? <laughs> Permission to come aboard. One of the things that I really appreciate the most about this character is the fact that he's a very human superhero. The things that sort of troubles him or affects his emotion and all that, you know, is one that I think a lot of us can relate to. I think fans are gonna see an Aquaman that is quite unlike anything they've seen before. That was awesome. My initial interest in this character was the fact that he was a superhero that hasn't been done that often before. The opportunity to go in there not with sort of expectations they've already kind of laid in place meant that it allows me as an artist to just kind of play with it a bit more and just kind of create things and bring things to this character that, you know, that people love but might not have seen him to this degree. In the comic book, they got to explore the monstrous world, the underwater creature, and for me, going to the film, I really wanted to embrace just how most of us all feel about the ocean. On one hand, it is majestic, it is magical, and it is unlike anything we've ever seen before, right? But on the other hand, it's also very terrifying, and it's scary, and we don't know what's down there. And I love the idea of like these two sort of separate philosophy thinking kind of like coming together in this film. We're here. What are you doing? Wait, wait, wait. You should have a parachute. Redheads, you gotta love them. When I first met Jason, I was kind of blown away at how charismatic he was and how funny he actually is in person and how goofy he actually is. And so uh, I really wanted to bring a lot of his personality and his character traits into this character because I think people are just going to love him. Jason's a very physical guy, obviously. Growing up surfing and swimming and just playing in the ocean. And so honestly, I can't think of a better person to embody this character than Jason. Taking that classic, iconic image that we have of this guy and applying that to Jason Momoa was a really fun thing to do.
I've been such a big fan of Sideshow, it's why I love making this movie, because I know down the line, someone like Sideshow will come along and really do amazing justice to the characters from the film. It's funny because we spend all this time designing the costume, and we spend forever trying to get the trident looking just right, but then to actually see what you guys did to it, I think it made me appreciate what we did even more to actually come up close and really appreciate the quarter scale of the character and, and all the details that you guys have put into it, it blew me away and it made me really happy with what we did on the film and it just made me super excited to want to take one of these guys back into my collection. <laughs> to be part of this particular property is incredible. It has been an incredible journey so far to design and make this film to work with all the people that I did, all the amazing artists. I realized not many filmmakers get the chance to do something like this, and here I am, you know, working on such an iconic character. To be able to put my own stamp onto this property it is beyond a dream come true. Welcome back to Sideshow Live. Big thank you to Olivia for stopping by and being awesome. Uh, right now, we are going to show you something in the realm of Christmas. Uh, it is the Die Hard Christmas... Uh, what's, the, what's the book called? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I like turned off my iPad because I was like, oh, well, I'm not going to need that because I'm just doing a little intro. Um, is this just Die Hard? Die like Hard, the illustrated holiday, like, holiday book. Die Hard, the illustrated holiday book. There, It's Die Hard, a Die Hard Christmas book. <laughs> die Hard, a Die Hard Christmas book. You're welcome. We'll be back afterwards with a live Q&A with all of us in the crew. This is why I need notes. Um, you're watching Sideshow Live. Thank you to Steve Bloom for doing this for us. It was a pleasure to work with you. And now, Die Hard, a Die Hard Christmas book. Oh, is this thing on? Oh, hi everybody, I'm Steve Bloom, and we have a very special treat for you today. A little piece of holiday cheer brought to you by Sideshow and Inside Editions. So fetch yourself a cup of hot chocolate and sprinkle it with marshmallows. Snuggle up, settle in, and relax, because today we're going to be reading Die Hard, the Illustrated Holiday Classic by Doogie Horner. And here we go. I'm so excited about this. Die Hard Christmas, the illustrated holiday classic written by Doogie Horner, illustrated by J.J. Harrison. Twas the night before Christmas, and up in the tower, everyone was partying, except one wallflower. John McLean missed his wife. Things just weren't the same since Holly had moved west and changed her last name. He tried to win her back, but she still said no. While unbeknownst to them, there was trouble below. A truck had pulled up, and who should disembark but 14 men whose intentions were dark. They spoke not a word and unloaded big crates. They cut the phone lines and locked all the gates. Carl swept the ground floor, shooting every guard dead, while visions of bearer bonds danced in his head. John took off his shoes, making fists with his toes. It actually worked. Well, what do you know? When out in the lobby there arose such a clatter, he sprung to the door to see what was the matter. When what to his wandering eyes should appear, Holy crap, there are terrorists here? John hid under a table where no one could see and watched Hans question Mr. Takagi. I'm going to count to three. There will not be a four. Give me the codes to open the vault door. I don't know the codes. Go ahead and shoot. Okay, said Hans Gruber. And ruined Takagi's suit. 
John tried to call the cops by pulling an alarm, but instead called the bad guys who tried to cause him harm. But John killed Tony, who had very small feet, and sent him to the terrorists as a Yuletide treat. He pulled a Santa hat on the German, and eyes all aglow wrote, Now I have a machine gun, ho, ho, ho. Carl was furious. Tony was his brother. He chased John across the roof, and they shot at each other. John was able to escape through the ventilation shafts. Come out to the coast, he sighed. We'll have a few laughs. At Nakatomi Tower, Sergeant Powell appeared. He checked the whole lobby and saw nothing weird. He was pulling away, but didn't get far before Marco landed on the hood of his car. Powell drove away backwards, screaming in fright. Welcome to the party, pal, John yelled with delight. More people arrived, the FBI and a SWAT team, but Hans didn't mind, it was all part of his scheme. More rapid than eagles, his henchmen they came, and he radioed and shouted and called them by name. Now Eddie, now James, now Franco, now Uli. On Fritz and on Carl, hair long and unruly. They shot the SWAT tank with a surface-to-air missile and knocked it away like the down of a thistle. Now John McClain was angry indeed. He blew up two terrorists and called them jerkweed. Ellis told Hans, Booby, I'm your white knight. Han shot him dead, giving the hostages a fright. Han went to go check on the explosives fuse and saw that poor John wasn't wearing any shoes. John fled from Carl and Hans, but alas, he had to run barefoot over sharp, broken glass. His feet, how they hurt, his soles, oh, so bloody. John crawled to the bathroom and called his good buddy. John was weary and ready to throw in the towel until he got a pep talk from Sergeant Al Powell. Powell was chubby and plump, a right jolly old cop, and he trusted the cowboy in the tattered tank top. But a reporter was probing into McLean's life and revealed that Holly was actually John's wife. Hans quickly flipped over the gold picture frame it's a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. McLean. His clothes all tarnished with ashes and soot, John staggered to the roof, bloody and barefoot. Ugh. I know how he feels. Ugh. Anyway. The explosives were wired to the rooftop with care in hopes that the hostages soon would be there. John warned everyone the rooftop would soon blow as the chopper strafed him with high-powered ammo. Around his waist, he tied a fire hose tight and screaming an oath, jumped into the night. He dangled in the air and gritted his teeth while flames encircled the tower like a wreath. Fiercely fighting his way back inside, John yelled out, Hans! He was done trying to hide. He limped to the vault like an old man on crutches, only to find Holly in his filthy clutches. John dropped his gun, put his hands on his head. It seemed he and Holly would soon be dead. But with a secret gun taped to his back, John shot Hans in a surprise attack. Hans fell out the window while holding Holly's arm and slowly, deliberately raised his firearm. The tenacious villain held on by his nails till John unhooked Holly's watch and said, happy trails. Bearer bonds fluttered like fresh fallen snow as Holly embraced her blood spattered bow. So, Merry Christmas to all. Be kind to one another. And most of all, yippee-ki-yay, mother...
<laughs> well, wasn't that jolly? I hope you enjoyed our festive trip to Nakatomi Plaza. That was Die Hard, the Illustrated Holiday Classic by Doogie Horner. Brought to you by Sideshow and Inside Editions. You can pick up a copy wherever fine books are sold. And of course, directly at side.show slash dieharddbook. Happy holidays, everybody. And don't forget to let your geek side show. video so much. Welcome back to Sideshow Live, everyone. Hello. Oh my gosh. Big thank you. Thank you so much to Steve Bloom for coming in and doing that for us. He is awesome and part of our little Sideshow family. It's so much fun to work with him whenever we get to. So you guys, we have some questions coming in for all y'all. Just so you know. So we're starting with what is the coolest gift that you got as a child that you still have today? Which is really tough because like, I can think of some cool gifts I got as a kid, but I don't know a whole lot that I still have. You know? The only one that I really can think of is like, I have like a couple R2D2 little action figures, like Kenner ones that I still have that I got as a kid. So that was probably for me the coolest. I used to have an Ewok village, but I don't have that anymore. I also used to have a My Little Pony castle and technically I, my niece has it now. So it's still around, but it's not mine. Like how old are we talking? I don't, he just said as a kid. So like, you know, the J Jamie Dewberry. Yes, Sam. So I mean, Christmas 1994 or something, my dad went out my dad went out and he bought an entire collection of uh, Power Ranger stuff. He bought all the figures, all like the Power Ranger toys. Power Ranger toys. Yes. All the Megazords, all like the accessories. Oh my gosh. Things. He like, like. That's a I lot. Still have every single one of them. You still have all of your every Megazords and everything? Because here's the thing he bought two of every one. So one do you I still have them in a box? Yeah. Or did you take them out and play with them? I saw them in a box. See, I was a, I was a, I was a play kid. Everything came out of the box, everything. So yeah. none of my toys are worth anything. He bought me two sets, so he bought me one that I could play with as a kid, and then one that I could hold, he could hold on to and give to me when I was. By the way, what do y'all think of this Santa hat? Because I'm really digging it. I think I could definitely see around. Have like a second career as like Santa Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely looks better like this. What up? Anyway, <laughs> any more toys <laughs> from childhood? Really? It's all about Legos. All about Legos? Yeah, Legos. Legos, you step on them and they hurt. Yeah, but do you still have them? Do you still yeah, have no, the whole I, set? I still have them, like, yeah. they're, but they're all... See, that's the obviously... tough part. I still have my Care Bear from, like, my birthday when I was a kid. That's, the, like, one thing. I have my Teddy Bear. I have a Teddy Bear also from when I was a kid. His name is Jelly Bear. Oh, mine is my, my. I'm was super creative. Mine's name is Big Bear, because he was a big bear. Really, we thought We were like, yeah. Mine is the color of like jam. So. Yeah, Jelly Bear and Big Bear. They could uh, be friends. I wouldn't say all my Legos are still together though, but they're they are. In so you definitely have like one of the original Legos <laughs> from yeah, your yeah, original the, yeah, Lego so, set. Like, the pieces are there. Just not together. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, hey everyone, what is your favorite Christmas movie? Christmas Vacation. Christmas Vacation? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I really, say... everyone, it's Christmas Vacation? <laughs> well, <laughs> that or Home Alone 2. Home... Sam also likes Home Alone 2. He made oh. a huge deal about it during Miracle the podcast. On 34th Street. Miracle on 34th Street. I love Miracle on 34th Street. Yeah, and I also, good. I love Muppet Christmas Carol. Mm. I... No. <laughs> <laughs> Bree just goes, no. no. I love Santa Claus. The Santa Claus is pretty good, too. That's how I... So, I'm... My mom's family's from Hawaii, and there aren't fireplaces in Hawaii, and I got very concerned as a child, very concerned that Santa was not going to be able to find us. The Santa Claus actually helped relieve that stress that I had as a kid <laughs> about it, because, you know, it just a, a fireplace just appears. So, thank you, Santa Claus. The Santa Claus. Nice pun there in the title. Brendan, you haven't answered any questions. 
You don't have a favorite Christmas movie? Apparently I, he doesn't believe in Christmas. <laughs> Brendan's our bah humbug Scrooge in the room. Are you just repeating everything that Jeff says? You're just like, okay, Jeff said it, it must be true. Well, that's general. Well, um, favorite Christmas movie is Gremlins. Gremlins, is not Christmas, non Christmas. Like Disney ones were there. I'm trying to think. Of I'm just Beauty and the Beast, like, Enchanted John, Christmas. Okay, the Santa Claus is a Disney movie. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the movie agenda, Misty would like to know, what is your favorite movie that came out this year and what movie are you looking forward to next year? That's easy. Into the Spider-Verse. Thwip, thwip. Yeah, you want to throw out some more spoilers? Thwip, thwip. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sam, you want to spoil it some more for the people who haven't seen it? Shut up. I'm sorry. <laughs> thwip, thwip. Yeah, Into the Spider-Verse. Um, I also loved Black Panther. Yes. I loved Ant-Man and the Wasp. Oh my God, that came out earlier this year. It did come out earlier this year. It came out in July. Holy cow. Is it no Shape of Water this year? No, Shape of Water was year? last year. But I loved Shape of Water also. Yeah. I keep going Haunting of Hill House, but that's like that's not a movie. Right. Oh, I hated the way that ended. Oh, really? I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I liked it. It was a great show. I liked it a lot. <laughs> I loved the whole thing. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, and then what movie are y'all looking forward to next year? Oh, End game. Game. Endgame? Endgame? Yeah. yeah. Episode 9. Oh, episode episode nine. 9, and then also Captain Marvel, guys. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not a movie, but Game of Thrones counts. Uh, you did six movies. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I had six movies. I, that's what, why I was thinking Haunting of Hill House, because that's like a 13-hour movie. Well, people mm -hmm. binge it nowadays, so it's not yeah. like watching individual shows anymore. But. Yeah. Um, are any of you watching Titans? No. Not yet. There's so much I need to watch. Yeah, I'm so behind on TV. I did watch Elseworlds, though. Did anyone watch Elseworlds? Batwoman for the win. I'm excited for Ruby Rose's Batwoman, like, to be a thing. No, no, no one else. Okay, fine. All right. So, uh, what Christmas song can you guys not help but sing along to? Jingle Bells. Awesome. Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells. Let it snow. Wham's Last Christmas. I hate that song <laughs> so much. I hate it. It gets stuck in my head. No, you know, Feliz Navidad. I always sing like, Feliz oh Navidad. God. You just sing it. Um, but yeah, that Wham's is like, oh my God. Whew. All right. Um, will there ever be sideshow battle mechs? Like, like like a mech Jeff that battles a mech Susan? Because mech, mech Jeff would win that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it all sounds like McDonald's sandwiches and mech Jeff. Mech Jeff. Jeff mech. Definitely Chicky would be a mech for I, sure. I, I would love to be a mech. I would love to be a mech as well. I'm like super into mechs. I loved Evangelion. And so now I'm all about, I was all about mechs. I want to be a mech. You don't get to be a mech. Oh. Actually, Challenger would make a pretty good mech, to be fair. But would you want to I mean, be- I like Gundams, I like robots. So. But would you be a Transformer that turns into your car? Yeah, this is probably. what to, this is a Transformer in my yeah. head. You can turn into a Challenger. What car are you? Are you a Pinto? He's a Challenger. <laughs> Aww. You guys. Um, aw. Guys, well, first off, I, I want to ask this question. But also, I also don't like to play favorites. So, what? what who has been your favorite guest this year? Steve Bloom. Steve Bloom. He's an idol. Oh, yeah. I love Steve Bloom. I love all of our guests. Anyone who takes the time to come out here and to like hang out with us is amazing in my book. And they're generally really nice. And they're so nice. Yeah. And we've had Niambi and Alfonso come in and unbox stuff. They brought in their friend Malcolm to unbox stuff. We've had Titus come in probably more than he should have. He's, 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 he's like unofficial sideshow. Uh, like he has a name now. badge, guys. We made <laughs> yeah, Titus like his our own. Unofficial spokesperson. Yeah, yeah, we made he Titus works, a name he badge. He works, he he works here. Yeah. Um, and then who else? What We had Bobby Moynihan and Eli Newell. William uh, Stout. William Stout. Stout Vanessa Andrews, Marshall. Donnie Cates. Donny Cates. Oh my God, Donnie was also a really fun guest to have. Mm -hmm. um, Susan Eisenberg. 
Susan Eisenberg and George Newman. I love them both. Kevin Conroy. <laughs> I'm just going to cry talking about Kevin Conroy. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. Olivia, <laughs> Olivia, Olivia, Olivia. Um, D. Bradley Baker. So many cool people. Yeah. We've had, we're really lucky. We are. We're really lucky. And we're, we hope that you like these guests because we like having the guests, but they're really for you. Um, so we can show off the fandom and talk about being geeks together. To me, that's what this is all about. It's the community that we're all talking together. It's what the Facebook group does. It's what we do. It's what they're trying to do. Sam Witwer. How did I forget him? Daniel Logan. Daniel Logan. Graham Daniel McTavish. McTavish. Oh, I love Graham. I just started watching Castlevania only because like of Graham. And <laughs> I, I love it, by the way. Graham's awesome. He does such a good job as Dracula. That's not a spoiler. <laughs> Carla Ortiz was a killer guest. That's Kitty coming through the mm -hmm. iPad. Kill yeah, Carla Ortiz. Carla Ortiz became like my best friend like immediately. <laughs> she was so good. Oh, yeah. Um, what statue, and then this is sweet of Jesse to say, that has been announced. Are you looking uh, forward to next year? That's she Hulk. She Hulk. Next year, but she Hulk? Miles Morales. Miles Morales. Well, I guess Silk is Silk going to be this year or next year? Does she, Silk's uh, like shipping next I think year. She's like, yeah, it's got to be next year because we only have like a week. Left. That's true. <laughs> we only have like two weeks left of this year. So Silk, I guess. I love Silk. Electra. Did we mention yeah. Eli? Oh, we did mention Eli. I love me. Oh my God, <laughs> Eli's. My... <laughs> no, we didn't mention Eli. <laughs> so get this orange robot. For Halloween. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm Eli. <laughs> uh, I'm, say your name. I'm Eli. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, you guys. Oh, sorry. Are you guys doing anything fun between Christmas and New Year's? Sleeping? Partying. Road trip. I was, like, work. I was like, I'm going to be working and working. sleeping like a normal human. <laughs> Um, what is on, because they said, what is on Susan's holiday wish list? But I want to open this up. What is on everyone's holiday wish list? Like sideshow pieces, like statues, or like anything. And can we put anything on this list? You know, I, oh, I actually thought of something. I really want the Women of the Galaxy book that Amy Radcliffe wrote. The one that's all about the women of Star Wars. I really want that book for Christmas. That's at the top of my wish list. That and mm, an a raccoon purse. It exists. Loungefly made one. Just saying. Oh, I thought you wanted just a raccoon purse. No, no, no. <laughs> Loungefly made a specific raccoon purse that's Miko from Pocahontas, and it's really cute, and I want it. So that and Women of the Galaxy, I think, are my top two. I can't think of anything. You can't think of anything you want? for. hang out with Olivia. You want to hang out with Olivia? I think she's right outside. And there's your Christmas gift, Brie. Yeah. <laughs> she's in Made My Dreams. Oh my gosh. It's because I'm Santa. Santa Susan. That's a thing now. Hashtag. Oh, Susan Claus. I like that better. Hashtag Susan Claus. That also sounds like I have claws. <laughs> you, did, you did have one point. Oh, I did. I was, I was X-23 this year, so I did have claws. Twit, twit. <laughs> um, anyway, what, no one else wants anything for Christmas? Not for Christmas. Amazon Just in, gift cards. Amazon gift cards. That's Peace on Earth and goodwill towards humans. All right, Tiny yeah, Tim, yeah. get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Amazon gift cards, Starbucks gift cards, yeah. comic, support your local comic shop. Yeah. Seize candy. Seize candy. Those always show up. Yeah. Know, that's for it. Yeah, no, Seize candy <laughs> shows show up. up. Same with Starbucks gift cards, but they usually show up for spectacular. Ooh. The Doctor Strange Omnibus. I just thought about that. The Doctor Strange Om. Oh, like the art print? No, not the, no, no, the, the actual, actual like graphic. Oh, art. oh, I was like, yeah. that, art, that art print by Alex <laughs> Ross is really cool. Yeah, I want that too. <laughs> Um, and then also just, yeah, to hang out with Olivia more would be a good gift. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yes. Um, cool. That's a lot of questions, you guys. Um, what, all right. And this is actually a very good question. Maybe it can't be answered yet, but next year is Sideshow's 25th anniversary. 
Are we celebrating it? The answer that is vague is yes. Yes. Can we tell you what we're doing yet? No. no. But I can tell you that it's Sideshow, so it'll be awesome. Every Oh, Lego Movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to sing Everything is Awesome, and then I was like, oh, the second part of the Lego movie's coming out. That's All right, guys. This has been an awesome show. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing holiday season. No matter how you celebrate, do doesn't matter, because we just really want you to like spend some time eating some good food. We hope you get everything that you're looking for. When you... Uh, you need to be notified about every time we go live, so head on over to side.show slash notify to be told whenever we do these types of shenanigans. So you guys, again, thank you so much for watching. Have an, a wonderful and very merry holiday season. Thank you. I said thank you so much for watching. You guys, don't forget to let your geek side show. Bye.